Okay, and we are live on YouTube. We are live on YouTube. Great. Welcome back to the afternoon session of the August 2nd, 2022 public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. This meeting is being held via Zoom and live streamed on our YouTube channel. We are resuming this afternoon with public hearing item number five, and we are about two hours behind schedule. So if you would like to participate in any of the public hearing items um, and you go to our agenda to look for the estimated time, please note that we are behind schedule um, and hopefully we'll be making up some of that time this afternoon. And so if your item is later in the day, you may want to just keep an eye on the YouTube channel to see where we are as we near the item that you're interested in. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Caroline Kane Levy to take us through the afternoon agenda. Thank you. <clears throat> We're starting up with item number five, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the Borough of Manhattan. Docket number 22-12370 at 165 Waverly Place in the Greenwich Village Historic District, Block 593, Lot 51, a vernacular style dispensary building built in 1831 and altered in 1854. The application is to install signage. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Um, Rose, you now have control of the presentation um, and the project team. May Sorry, Abby, you, I think you muted yourself. So the project team may begin. You just state your name uh, and introduce yourself before you begin the presentation. Hey everyone, I'm David Ludwigson. I'm the vice president and chief development officer at God's Love We Deliver. And I will uh, be brief as I know uh, you're running long today. Um, God's Love We Deliver is a 37 year old organization. We began as an AIDS service agency and in 2001 expanded our mission to include people living with all life altering illnesses. So today we serve clients living with more than 200 different diagnoses. Over the past two years, we have seen tremendous growth both organic growth and due to COVID. And this year we will cook and home deliver more than 3 million meals to people in New York City um, and beyond. Uh, all of our services are always provided free of charge. And we are grateful to uh, the Bender family, William Gottlieb Real Estate for making the historic Northern Dispensary um, available to us to accommodate uh, this growth. Um, is underway in the building and moving quickly. And we hope to take occupancy sometime in September. And God's Love will have 40 people working from that facility from our program staff. Uh, these are folks who are on the phone um, each day with our clients setting up services. There will be no production, food production, or anything like that taking place in the building. Um, the question today is our sign that will go on the front of the building as a branding uh, decision and to help promote our work and leverage all of the excitement that we've seen around God's love moving into the Northern Dispensary. We have uh, created a logo or lockup as it's called, that is God's love we delivery at Northern Dispensary. Um, and we think that it's important uh, from a branding perspective, both so that we can leverage the excitement of, of occupying the building and also to avoid confusion between our home base, the Michael Coors building on the corner of Sixth Avenue and Spring Street and our new uh, facility here at the Northern Dispensary. So internally and externally, we will be referring to it as God's love we deliver at Northern Dispensary. So our request is that the sign on, on the outside of the building um, looks like what, what I think everybody can see on the screen. Um, 
and that it matches the lockup that uh, we've created again from a branding perspective and to help avoid confusion. And Andy Simmons, who uh, developed the logo for us is on and can answer more specific questions about the sign. And I would just show you one um, example of, of how we're using that. Uh, this is a hat we developed. This ND is actually taken from the fireplace mantle inside the building, which we thought was fabulous. And then everywhere where we say God's love we deliver in connection with this building, we will have at Northern Dispensary. So that's just one way that uh, we would intend to use the, the language and the lockup. And um, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Andy to answer more specific questions about exactly what the sign will look like um, on the building. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, Andy Simons, uh, Emphasis Design, where the graphic design designers have been assisting God's love we deliver on this project. Uh, could we advance the slide, please? So this is the exterior of the building. We, we're actually putting you know, very limited signage on it. The majority of the signage is code-related signage. Uh, uh, advance the slide, please. <clears throat> this shows you the historic uh, building. Uh, from the 1870s, 1885. Next slide, please. And then uh, all the way up to 1934. So the 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 building is you know is triangular shape. The signage on it has always been fairly minimal. Uh, next slide. So this shows you the the building today. It has a historic plaque, uh, a, a marble plaque above the main entrance, the existing main entrance, which is being altered, and then an, a second historic uh, wooden sign that says Northern Dispensary to the east of the, the main entrance, uh, aligning with the two windows. Uh, next slide. So th this shows you an elevation of the new stoop design uh, and the handicap lift. It shows you our recommended sign or suggested sign to the west of the, of the main doors. And the two gray boxes are the existing marble plaque and the uh, existing wooden historic sign. We also have the address as dimensional letters on the new, on the face of the new stoop. And those letters are uh, painted aluminum pin mounted letters. Uh, next slide, please. This shows you the same rendering. Uh, but in color and with our sign uh, fully rendered off to the west of the front entrance. Next slide. This is a detail of the sign, uh, not showing you the background color, but showing you the logo of God's love we deliver, the lockup that David was describing at, that at Northern Dispensary, uh, this co-branding experience to both represent the excitement around this, this historic, uh, place of, of uh, medical service and in now God's love housing it, and then the heart with the helping hand. Uh, next slide. So this just shows you a section of how the, the sign is uh, manufactured and some uh, more uh, dimensions. The si sign itself is four foot six. It's going to sit centered between the door and the window. Uh, from street level, it's about 10 feet up. Uh, but it's at eye level when you're standing on the stoop. So it's uh, at about five foot to uh, when you're standing at the top of the stoop. The way the sign is gonna be manufactured is that it has a sign pan behind it, which will hold the illumination, which will be LED illuminated. That sign pan will be painted to match the yellow, I mean, I'm sorry, the orange red brick. All of the, the sign will be non-illuminated during the day it will be this orangey red background with the red and black logo on it. And then at night, the letters, which actually are acrylic that come through the, the uh, sign face and have their opaque coloring on it, glow around the edges at night. And that's referred to as a holo, uh, sorry, a halo uh, illumination. So, at night, you just have a glow around the letters. During the day, it is non-illuminated at all, sitting on a background that is meant to blend into the brick. 
the penetrations by by having a sign panel here we don't have to penetrate for every single letter we only need to penetrate four to six times to secure the sign to the the uh, brick surface those penetrations will be made into the um into the mortar joints the electrical will also come through a mortar joint and the transfer required transformers will be housed in the staircase remotely so there'll be a, a total of you know, four to six uh, penetrations through the mortar joints uh, for this sign. The uh, illumination levels for the sign will be fairly low, about 75 lumens, which is about five candlelights. Uh, the sign will be installed with a dimmer. So if it's determined that that's too bright, it can be adjusted to, uh, to accommodate uh, the desires for illumination. It will also be on a timer and have a photo sensor uh, a photo light sensor to make sure that it's not running during the day. Uh, next slide. These are just standard required code signs of not blocking exits and not uh, and providing appropriate information for uh, handy able people to access the access uh, the uh, lift. The way we we install signs on historic fences is that we have a back plate. And they're basically sandwiched against the wrought iron fence. Uh, that way, it doesn't actually damage the fence at all, and it's just pinching in between the uh, the uh, pickets of the fence. Uh, next sign. This just shows you a detail of the address for the building. Like I said, it's painted black to match the wrought iron fence, the historic wrought iron fence. Individual dimensional letters that are pin mounted and secured into the new. Uh, cast concrete uh, uh, stoop. Uh, so that's it. We could probably maybe go back to the uh, the detail of the illuminated sign, which I assume would probably be the, or the elevation would probably be the good place to discuss things. Thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, I don't see any questions right now. So we'll move to public testimony and we may have questions after that. If you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sonia Gior to take us through the testimony. Thank you. So we do have one sign up in advance, Michelle Arbelou. And Michelle, if you could please accept the request to become a panelist. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, Michelle Arblu for the Historic Districts Council. HDC believes that the background color of the sign should match the existing building rather than trying to match the color of the brick. Thank you. Thank you. And so we do not have any other signups in advance and I'm not seeing any hands raised. So I'll note that Manhattan Community Board 2 recommends approval. And I'll turn it back to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you very much. So would you like to address the comment about the, the background color of the sign? Um, could you actually restate what she said? I, I didn't hear her. She kind of went in and out. I apologize. She wanted it to match the background color of something else, not the brick. Not the brick. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, Sonia, if you have, uh, if you can characterize Michelle's testimony. Don't have it in front of me, unfortunately. I thought she said that it matched. Oh, in, I can say it again. Okay, just say it again. <laughs> we believe the background color of the sign should match the existing building rather, uh, the sorry, match the existing building sign rather than trying to match the color of the brick. Okay, I, I thought I'd heard existing sign, but I was trying, I wasn't sure if it, which sign mm -hmm. it meant. Okay, so I guess the idea is to have um, the signs relate to each other more. We could, we could, we could definitely look at that. Uh, I would have to talk to the client about, uh, you know, we would have to vary from their brand standards, which has black type, and that sign is a dark brown. And obviously we wouldn't get very good legibility from a, a a black a brown background with black type on it but i i don't i i see the logic there okay all right and i you know and i appreciate the comment we'll see what the commissioners think about um color we don't we actually are usually 
we try to be flexible with uh, co companies brand colors. So um, we'll think about that. There may be a, a different solution for the background color or a different solution altogether. So we'll think about that as we have our discussion. Commissioners, do we have any final questions? Okay, I'm gonna send you all requests to unmute so that we can uh, begin our discussion. Commissioner Chen, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Gold uh, Goldblum, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed. And so we are looking at, there's uh, uh, the main sign that is uh, being presented to us today is this horizontal sign adjacent to the door that would have a uh, metal background and push through letters with a halo lit lighting. And, um, and then there's the address on the stoop and the, the signs that are associated with the mechanical lift. Um, so we'll begin our discussion on, you know, we, and our discussion may focus on size, location, uh, and material as well. So um, Commissioner Devonshire, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um, I, I love this building. I did a condition assessment of it uh, about 12 years ago. It's really a fantastic thing. Um, I'm actually okay with the signage as is. I think if it was black like the other sign, it would be in competition with it. I think this way, that original Northern Dispensary sign is the more prominent one and does the job. So I'm okay with this as presented. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, likewise, yeah. I actually don't have much problem with this. Okay. Commissioner Bland? I think I'm not passionate either way, but I sort of like uh, HCC's testimony. So I might favor that, but I wouldn't vote against it with the majority going the other way. Okay, thanks. And uh, Commissioner Jefferson? Um, I'm torn. I think um, the, rec the rectangular one is fine, but the square one would be fine too, and the color would be fine. I, I um, I don't have a preference. Okay. All right. Thanks. And uh, Commissioner Gustafson? Yep. I, I think it's appropriate as is. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Uh, I do not think it should be a horizontal sign. I think that that's such a distinct, um, you know, image for the Northern Dispensary, that kind of long horizontal bar. So I actually think that um, it would be beautiful to see just the square heart hand with the God's love we deliver underneath it in that, like the, the way they have it in the left part of this, the page here. And I actually think that the heart could get bigger. I mean, I, you know, or that, that square could get bigger because it's, it's a powerful, um, you know, symbol image. And the fact that it's red is beautiful on this building and needs to be not horizontal like the Northern dispensary. Um, the rest of it, you know, if they need to say that, you know, the tag of North at Northern Dispensary, I think it could actually happen on the stoop underneath the, the or with the address. But I really think that the sign at the door should be square, which is to say we read the heart, the red heart. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, I can approve this as presented. Uh, I think that it's the way it looks is kind of discreet and blends in very well. And the colors, they couldn't really use those colors without, you know, a, a lot of problems with their existing uh, logo, uh, which is, of course, very distinctive and people recognize it. And the, I think the at Northern just I assume it's not just the place, but actually maybe an email address of some sort you might use. I don't know, but uh, I'm not sure. But I thought that was a nice touch, though, as Adi was just saying, their, their logo could appear bigger if it was on some. But, you know, I think I'm fine with it as it is, and you know, I'm, I'm okay with it. Okay. Commissioner Goldblum? 
Um, I think that Adi's right, but I think it's appropriate as is. I think it would be better, but as we know, that's not our standard. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think you right, you probably could get more of this information there with a bigger logo and a square sign. Um, but I also find that the horizontal sign is appropriate. I think that all the signs historically over time, which have been quite large and on the facade of the building, have been horizontal. And I think this one is modest in scale and, and doesn't compete with the wooden sign above the windows. And uh, and just, I think, as modestly announces their uh, presence here. So I think we have enough to support this. Commissioner Devonshire, would you make a motion to approve? Commissioner Devonshire. Sorry, I'm was muted. Okay. In the matter of LBC 22-12370-165 Waverly Pace in the Greenwich Village Historic District, an application to install signage. I recommend approval, finding that there is historic precedent for facade signage at this building necessitated by its use as a community health care center. And the proposed facade mounted plaque sign will support the ongoing use of the building. That the plaque sign will be installed through mortar joints in an area of plain brick and will not conceal or damage significant architectural features. That the proposed metal pin mounted address signage will be located at the new cast stone stoop cheek wall, therefore will not damage any significant historic fabric. And the proposed hanging plaque signs at the areaway fence and gate will be affixed with metal rods threaded through the pickets and will not detract from the building or streetscape. And the cumulative amount of signage will not overwhelm the building or the streetscape. Thank you. Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. All right. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. With nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. That's approved. Thank you. And we'll move to the next item. The next item is item number six, docket number 22-03944, 111. Uh, 1141 Broadway in the Madison North Historic District, Burr of Manhattan, Block 828, Lot 25. This is an application for a certificate of appropriateness, an Art Deco style commercial building designed by William L. Uh, I. Howhauser and built in 1926 to 27. And the application is to construct a rooftop addition. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing and the staff will walk you through the presentation. Okay, good afternoon, commissioners. Dina Taswinter, preservation staff. The application before you is 1141 to 43 Broadway, an Art Deco, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, an Art Deco style commercial building, currently a hotel, located at the corner of Broadway and West 26th Street within the Madison Square North Historic District. The proposal is to install a rooftop structure for use by the restaurant that occupies the top floor. Here's the 1940s tax photo and the existing conditions of the primary facades. Uh, this drawing just shows the streetscape along Broadway as, um, as existing. And these are the proposed elevations. The three awnings shown along the West 26th Street facade are being reviewed at staff level, but what is before you now is the metal and glass structure with the retractable awnings. Uh, this floor plan shows the footprint of that uh, rooftop addition seen on the east terrace here. And then this is the roof plan with the aluminum framing and retractable awnings. Um, some more details of, of the awnings and the massing of the structure. And here are the, uh, here's the addition rendered in both day and night views. As illustrated, uh, you can see that the structure is set back from the uh, existing parapets. And also uh, the glazing is partially operable. Uh, there's this accordion door condition and the aluminum framing will be finished to approximate the color of the existing brickwork at the facades. Some more views. 
Um, these are just some precedent examples of the design concept for reference. And here is the installed mockup. The proposed structure is not visible directly over the primary facade. So you can see here, there's no visibility, um, also no visibility from these views, but it does come into view from points south and north along Broadway. This and the following slide show the points of greatest visibility with the installed mockup on the left and the rendered view on the right. So here we're uh, to the south of the building looking north toward the primary facades at the corner. And then this is taken from the north looking back over the lot line facade. Um, I'll just go back to that primary view and the applicants are here to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for a clear presentation. Um, so do we have any questions for the applicant or Dina? Uh, I don't see any questions at this time. So we'll move to public testimony and then um, we'll come back. We may have more questions and we can certainly have the applicant respond to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sonia Bior to take us through the testimony. Thank you. So we do have some signups in advance. First speaker will be Michelle Arbelou. Michelle, I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please unmute your mic and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, Michelle Arbelou for the Historic Districts Council. HDC finds this proposal rooftop addition a bit too flimsy looking and lacking in appropriate articulation. We ask that the applicant work with LPC to develop something more in keeping with the building's architecture. Thank you. Thank you. So we do not have any additional speakers signed up and I do not see any hands raised at the moment. So I will note for the record that Manhattan Community Board 5 recommends denial, noting that the aluminum frame, glazed walls and retractable awning would be very visible from numerous vantage points and even more visible at night, and finds that the proposed addition would negatively impact the historic character of the building and district as viewed from ground level. And I'll turn it back to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you. So we've heard some comments about the, the flimsiness of the design is, or the perceived uh, flimsiness of the design. I think um, the light, let's say the lightweight <laughs> framing of the design and um, some comments from the community board about the visibility. I'd like to ask the applicant if they would like to respond to those comments. Hello. Hello, just state Hello. your name before you speak. My name is Hesuri. Uh, the proposed structure is basically a uh, composed of uh, aluminum frame and glass, and uh, most of uh, the elevation will be just open. Uh, the, the building is allowed that already the current CO allow us about uh, 46 outdoor seating, and then we wanted to provide uh, a little bit more comfortable outdoor space with the shade. So yet yeah, these days the outdoor space, uh, the importance of outdoor space is uh, getting higher. So yeah, we are uh, proposing a little bit more, yeah, comfortable, yeah, outdoor okay. space here. Then the, the main uh, the design is will be just uh, aluminum frame, kind, uh, it will be just a linear line and uh, the glass. So as you see the, uh, the hour of the rendering, uh, that color and the size of our proposed structure can be blended in existing building and surrounding. And also this structure is proposed on the top of a building. So yeah, visibility will be, yeah, less because this is a top floor, yeah. Okay, all right. So I think right here, just thinking that the, the lightweightness of it and the minimal views from these distances seen against the backdrop of other buildings will help it to blend away. Okay, so do um, 
commissioners, do we have any final questions for the applicant or Dina? I'm gonna send you all requests to unmute so that we can begin our discussion. So Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Chafin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. Um, Commissioner Jefferson, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um, it is visible from, from, this, from far away distances. But the interesting thing about this is that it, it looks temporary, it looks flimsy, and therefore I could approve it because it feels temporary. Um, although it's visible, I, I can still approve it. Yeah, in some ways the, the lightness of it helps it to look less bulky and heavy, okay, and therefore less permanent. Commissioner Gustafson? Yeah, I, I agree. It helps. It actually makes it disappear a bit more into the background. Um, so um, I'm okay with it. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yeah, I, I think that the rendering makes it look um, sort of blend in. I'm not sure if in reality it will be as thin as it appears in the rendering. This is a situation where the rendering actually really is very, it makes a good impression. Um, but I think this is what we have to go by. And I, and I think that ultimately it will um, despite being visible, not impact negatively uh, on our understanding of the building. And so I think it's appropriate. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin? Yes, I, I agree with uh, the comments of other commissioners and I can vote for that. Commissioner Goldblum? Agreed. Commissioner Devonshire? Yeah, I think from the sidewalk, uh, you'd be really at a loss to tell what it's made of. So. Uh, I think it's fine. Okay, Commissioner Chen. Agree. And Commissioner Bland. Uh, yes, I agree. And I just want to say that if you do look up and see it, it's a symbol of somebody's using their roof. Good for them. <laughs> That's right, activating those roofs in a context of their a very like active and busy context. So fitting for that. All right, Commissioner Jefferson, I think uh, we're in support. So would you make the motion? Sure. Um, in the matter of LPC-22-03944, dash 1141 Broadway, Madison Square, North Historic District. Application is to construct a rooftop addition. I note that the building style, scale, material, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Madison Square North Historic District. I recommend approval finding that the work will not damage or destroy any significant architectural feature of the roof, that the proposed addition will, will not be visible directly over the primary facade, that the addition would only be visible in conjunction with the primary facade from oblique angles at a great distance south along Broadway and to the east and west along 26th Street and over the secondary facade from, from the north along Broadway in the context of existing rooftop accretions found on this and other buildings, that the proposed addition will be seen against the backdrop of the building existing setback penthouse and masonry walls or adjacent buildings that the material and design of the addition featuring operable partial height glass panels, light colored street, street, steel framing and retractable canvas roofing is unobtrusive and in keeping with utilitarian roof features found in buildings throughout the historic district. And that the work will not detract from the special architectural or historic character of the building for the Madison Square North Historic District. Thank you. And Commissioner uh, Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. 
Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. With nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. That's approved and we'll move to the next item. All right, the next item is item number seven, uh, docket number 22-12330. 1071 Fifth Avenue, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, an interior landmark and, um, and also in the expanded Carnegie Hill Historic District, an individual landmark as well. Um, this is in the Borough of Manhattan Block 1500, Lot 1, um, a modern style museum building designed by Frank Lloyd Wright and built in 1956 to 59 and subsequently enlarged by an addition designed by Guafme Siegel and Associates and built in 1988 to 92. The application is to modify designated interior spaces. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Adam, you now have control of the presentation. Uh, please unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and then you may begin. You can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Great, thank you so much. Uh, before I get started, see, is that working? I clicked, there we go. Um, before I get started, uh, I'll, I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm Adam Nelson. Um, I work in partnership with the museum to help support the retail space. Uh, company name is Event Network. And I'm going to actually turn it over to Rich Avery, who's there with the Guggenheim Museum, um, and let him uh, give a little bit of background on, on how we got to this point. And then from there, I'll jump into some of the design changes that we're proposing. Go ahead, Rich. Uh, <clears throat> hello, I'm Rich Avery, the Senior Manager of Facilities for the Guggenheim Museum. Um, I'll just make a, a brief contextual statement here. Um, several years ago, the museum contracted Event Network uh, to take over, manage, and improve the museum's retail operations. Uh, one improvement uh, that's being proposed is a much needed renovation of the museum's bookstore and gift shop to which the museum does agree. <clears throat> in sorry, <clears throat> in regards to the stewardship of the building, in addition to working with Adam and his team at Event Network, museum consulted with Gunny Harbo and Bob Score of Harbo Architects, calling on their experience with the conservation and restoration of other Frank Lloyd Wright heritage sites in order to help guide the design process of this renovation towards a proposal that is both reflective of the existing furniture furnishings in the other public areas of the museum uh, and is still, while still being conducive to the current intended use of the bookstore space. Uh, Harbo, Ar <clears throat> Harbo Architects have submitted a letter in support of this proposal and Bob Score uh, is attending this hearing and is available for comment as well. And now I will turn it over to Adam. Thank you, Rich. Um, this is this is an exciting project to be part of. Obviously, an amazing landmark, and uh, much time and care has gone into trying to determine what what the right path forward is to meet the the current and future needs of of this retail space and help support their overall uh, mission and um, direction uh, for this organization, kind of in the coming years. I'm going to start with a little bit of background to help you understand how we got to where we are uh, with this space. Originally uh, outlined here, you'll see that the, the current retail space shown on this plan was originally a driveway at the start uh, as per Frank Lloyd Wright's original vision. Uh, soon after uh, opening the museum, they did a little more work and, and moved some things around. There was a store that was added to the main hall, uh, exhibit hall gallery space. And then uh, within about a decade, a, an expansion was created to help support some of the, the museum's goals and needs above the driveway space. At this point in time, the, the driveway was still intact as a pass-through area, but as we know, Many people saw an opportunity of a space that was already kind of covered and, and easy to grab. Uh, it was then infilled below. This is where we see sort of the first iteration 
of the bookstore start to exist within its its current location. And uh, this this space had uh, kind of the opportunity to live for quite some time as 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 the current retail uh, area. But um, I think within about a decade of this, they realized that again. Uh, some other major changes were going to be needed. Guafmi Siegel was engaged to help with the process of creating a new uh, space for the museum. And into the 80s um, and into the early 90s, the, the existing office tower was, was removed and a new uh, north tower space was constructed to, to meet the needs of the current and future needs of the museum. Uh, at this point in time, Guafmi Siegel uh, took uh, the opportunity to uh, landmark portions of the building, uh, which included uh, a portion of the store below. This is this is a good point in time to point out that um, though this, and we'll see the landmark portion on the next slide, uh, this was not Frank Lloyd Wright original architecture here that was uh, landmarked. This was Guafmi Siegel um, landmarking a, a piece of the part of the new building that they worked on. On this slide here, you can see uh, I've, I've zoomed in to really highlight the area that's under discussion. This is the area that that is landmarked. Um, that is the that was the original driveway space. On the left, uh, you can see highlighted in orange the casework. Uh, from Guafmi Siegel that's to be salvaged uh, from the space. You can also see some of the original Frank Lloyd Wright era reinforced concrete areas um, and structures that show up within this, the shop uh, and uh, some of the uh, existing conditions. On the right is an overview of some of the fixtures you'll see in the upcoming slides that we're looking to have brought in to um, meet the, the current and future needs of, of the retail space and uh, give an opportunity to the team there to do their job better and create a better guest experience that's, that's more consistent with, with the rest of the museum spaces. So as a point of reference, uh, we'll be looking in, in two different corners where the casework's changing. This is uh, the furthest area to the right, and we will have a few other photos, but that's the entrance uh, to the museum is on the furthest side of the right. Shown here is the existing casework with the existing point of sale. Uh, it is no longer, or, or I should say never has been ADA compliant. Um, it, it predates some of those requirements. And so as part of this, we'll be updating uh, the store to be brought up to ADA um, guidelines and make the store accessible to all users. Uh, we'll also be reducing um, the size of this, this piece of furniture. So there's a little more floor space, more a little more mobility within the store and, and make it more accessible uh, on the other side. So the proposed uh, changes to this corner uh, shown here, show the, the, that, that really heavy fixturing coming out um, and being brought in with a system that's a little more adaptable. Uh, it, it allows shelves to be moved more freely. The lights like the Guafmi Siegel fixtures are, are built in, um, allowing us to not have to make major changes to the lighting system, the, the landmark ceiling. The floor would also stay as it is. Uh, we would not be making changes to that. So this really is just this perimeter casework on this side as well as uh, the floor fixtures, instead of kind of a, a random assortment of things that have been picked up over the years, we've taken inspiration from areas within the museum, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright era casework designs and integrated them into the floor fixtures here. And we'll see a close up of those as well later on. If we turn around and look the other direction, um, you can see kind of a, a little bit more of this, this, these fixtures in the way that are kind of blocking the space, but we, we have this corner that looks toward this section of glass uh, at the back of this space. This back corner um, is, is a little bit troublesome and I'll, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but 
we can see the column here, the original Frank Lloyd Wright uh, co driveway column on the left. We'll be taking the shelves off of that. So it's really just about the column. It's kind of about accentuating that architecture a little bit more and letting it play a bigger important part um, within the space. And then on the right hand side, uh, this these bookcases that are kind of have random hardware and random bits and pieces would be pulled back uh, to the uh, structure and new casework would be placed uh, there so that the team can tell stories that are unique as the artists that you know are able to be displayed in this this great space and museum this is a, a view of what that corner would look like after construction um, that that back corner uh, it's one of the one of the problematic pieces of that is that it really can only um, handle a, a single guest at a time it's it's a very uncomfortable space to be in uh, it's it's also a loss prevention problem it's it's a corner for things to go be picked up and and stolen from um, so our proposal here is to relocate the point of sale to that side of the store and let that corner become a little bit of back of house space that that the team desperately needs to be able to refill products on the store floor this casework uh, is a is a movable partition. It's not a permanent built-in feature, and nor nor is the point of sale either. Um, so neither one of these are are being connected to any of the historic finishes. Uh, in that way, um, if it's deemed at some later date by the museum, um, this corner needed to be opened up. We'd be able to open it up in you know the same fashion that it is now, um, back to this uh, original sort of view. But it's it's our proposal here to to block that view. Uh, it does not go to the ceiling. There's there's not a code compliance issue from partitioning this, and it does allow some natural light to come over the top of that casework. And speaking to this window, when considering what to do with this, not only did we want to consider the internal view, but we also want to consider what was um, the view from outside the building. And our proposal here is to uh, put film over these glass panes that matches the panes to the left. Uh, so it would be sort of a white uh, film that is semi-transparent. It still lets some light through, but uh, you would not be able to see into this back of house space while it's being utilized in that way within the store. <clears throat> and then the other consideration that we want to make sure uh, is that the way we were utilizing this corner didn't impact in a significant way the entry experience into the museum if if that had been a important part of this you know experience to the original architect we want to make sure that we weren't messing with that and as you can see from this view it's it's not visible from the entry um, so it doesn't play an effect on on the entry or exit um, experience as as people pass through the store or, or i should say in and out of the museum Uh, I'll just go through a few of the fixtures that we're proposing and you can see the the Frank Lloyd Wright Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum furnishings uh, in the bottom left hand corners here that we are uh, mimicking as part of this with the the round over corners the matching uh, wood grains and finishes while still meeting ADA compliance um, for processing transactions and things like that the uh, we call an apron that goes behind the, the point of sale computers is removable. We imagine a time where, you know, this transaction may happen on a, on a cell phone or things like that. Um, we did want the visual partition because these spaces can become a little messy. We don't want the computer itself to detract uh, from the casework or things that are happening here. So it's it's just a about as simple as we can get. And then if if the future allows and, and those need to go away, um, those partitions could be removed and this could become just a single top uh, that, that's flat across. The power and data is fed through the base uh, that would connect into the sidewall as well. Uh, as we get into some of the floor fixtures, you can see uh, on the right here some elements, um, elements from the, the larger gallery space, a, a bench, uh, original, we think is an original coat hang area within the coat check space. Um, and, and replicating some of these horizontal and, and uh, vertical lines so that it is more consistent with other 
Frank Lloyd Wright era casework in the building and, and create that more consistent um, experience that is expected by guests. Um, again, bringing some of those lines and, and casework across into uh, some fixtures that are desperately needed to better sell artwork. Um, the, the way that it's done now is, is an old fashioned way of doing things um, and is, is really unsuccessful and very hard for people to navigate. So in looking at many other historic uh, museums, just not in the US, but also in London and other places taking inspiration from them, um, we were able to generate a new space that, that felt in line with the characteristics of, of the casework that's there, but also met the needs of the product. And then finally, uh, the last piece that we talk about here is the back partition doorway in that, that's gonna conceal that, that little corner. Uh, it would be constructed to uh, match and be uh, visually similar to this egress doorway that is between the retail store and the entrance to the museum. This is a space that we will not be removing. Uh, that casework is to remain. And uh, these, these original finishes um, that we'll be matching to would be brought over. So the, the door would be less of a you know, hollow core metal frame uh, standard door, but kind of more of this almost hidden panel, uh, very uh, simplified, as well as giving the team a little bit of space to display uh, potential products or, or allow them to give them some area to wrap up products and things like that uh, in this back cove. Um, so that's, that's it in a nutshell, uh, just to kind of reiterate some of the, the highlights here. We, we will not be touching the ceilings um, besides some very, very minor repairs where there's been maybe some hooks, things like that. Um, the ceilings are to stay you know, as they are, the floors to stay as it is in its landmarked condition. Uh, we will be pulling out the Guathme single era casework and replacing it uh, with um, casework that is that, that we've drawn inspiration from uh, more the Frank Lloyd Wright uh, era furnishings. We noticed, and, and it was my belief while looking at this, that, that Guafi Siegel had also tried to pull some of those same details, but um, instead of doing a copy of a copy, we thought we'd go back to the original and, and pull our inspiration from there. And, and the finishes, the, the team has a very specific set of finishes from the original, or should, I don't know, I don't know if I should say original um, finishing, but uh, going back a very long time, uh, those specifications, we're working with the casework company to make sure that it gets matched precisely. And uh, the you know, main fixtures that are on the floor are, are non-permanent. We're not gonna be drilling holes into this, this terrazzo condition, mounting things to the floor. It's, it's all gonna stay as is. And then the, the new casework really will be um, designed to handle a more standardized system uh, that, that will last a very long time. Uh, hardware and parts, bits and pieces will be able to be procured by future teams. Um, instead of a, a customized system that, that may leave them um, in, in trouble in, in years to come. So that's, that's it real quick. Um, it's, it's not a huge space, but, it, but it just such an important space. I, I really appreciate uh, everybody's time today, you know, taking a look at this and look forward to some of the feedback. All right, thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. Just, just one question. Uh, on the left-hand side, page 18, the angle wall, was that by Guathney or by Frank Lloyd Wright? The, can, I, can you see my hand? I don't know. Yeah, is, yeah. Is it this wall here you're talking about? No, the one on the left, the figure on the left. The, this the this here. The yes, this, this is uh, what they, I think they refer to these as footballs, and it is original cast. Uh, column with that was originally located within the, the driveway space. Um, and so that is original Frank Lloyd Wright uh, casting architecture. Okay, so the, but if you go to the image on the left, okay, where there's an angle wall to the, in that image to the right, there's an angle wall. It seems to me it's an angle wall, not, not that column, the wall, that one. It doesn't Yes. Is that by Frank Lloyd Wright? No. Is it by 
glass me. Yep. Any any straight surfaces within this room are Guafmi Siegel. Curved surfaces date back to uh, the original building. Okay. So it's, am I looking at the image wrong? Is that a straight wall? Uh, this, is a, this is a straight wall on this side, and that's what corresponds to this wall uh, on, on this side of the room. And, and the millwork is angled, correct? Or am I missing that? The, the millwork, it, it's probably the, pers and I apologize, it's, it was kind of hard to get a good photo within the space. The, the perspective of the photo may be distorted a little bit. Um, it is, uh, if we go back to, well, if we look at this floor plan, um, this is that sort of football shape. And I can go all the way up if you'd like to see something that's a little bit bigger. We can do that. It's just don't want to overshoot it with this. Uh, let's see, is it? It's not moving for me. Let me see. Let me try this. Okay. We'll go up to the bigger floor plan so it is easier to answer your question. That wall. That go back. That, go back. Um, one more. This, one this one more. That has the angle wall. That wall is that angle? Uh -huh. or that straight. This is this wall is is straight. That one um, the fascia is, but the woodwork is angled, correct? The woodwork is set back in underneath this. Uh, there's there's additional casework above here that is uh, concealed behind some panels. Um, it's it is each each cubby is set back um, underneath the the walls within there are square. Uh, within each cubby, they each one in it unto itself is not angled. If I understand the question correctly, well, the, I don't know. It looks angled. Is 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 this wall the the vertical wall? Is it angled? The one that comes down with the light is that wall angled or not? The wall um, is not angled. It does not. The the okay. ceiling is angled. Yes, the walls that may are be perpendicular. What's... So that, that what, be, that's be, what may be throwing off the image. The ceiling is at an angle. Okay. This this corner is higher than this corner out on the left hand side. Okay. I, I, that I, that may be what's throwing you off, and I apologize for not. Uh, no, that's okay. I'm sorry to take too much time. Thank oh you. no, not at all. No worries. Okay. Any other questions? All right, let's move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And we'll start with anyone who signed up in advance and get to everyone else after that. And I will turn it over to Sonia Gior to take us through the testimony. Thank you. So we do have some signups in advance. Our first speaker will be Lara Varayale from Friends of the Upper East Side. And I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And if you can please unmute your mic and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Um, Laura Varelli, representing Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District. Chair Carroll and Honorable Commissioners. The Guggenheim Museum is one of the rare examples of a complete work of art in architecture. As it is customary in modern architecture, every single aspect of this building was carefully designed including utilitarian elements such as furniture. We're pleased to see that the proposed store of furniture is inspired by original Frank Lloyd Wright pieces instead of a contemporary nondescript aesthetic. The existing museum store was first enclosed in the mid 70s and altered to its current configuration in the early 1990s during Guatemi Siegel's expansion. Despite not being part of Wright's or original design, this space is surrounded by his very characteristic geometric shapes derived from the simplification of natural forms. The original administration wing, known as the circular monitor and its loz lozenge-shaped staircase and the concrete columns are, are a notable part of Wright's quest for the interpenetrating geometric shapes. While we're not opposed to the configuration, to the reconfiguration of the store, Friends believes that the movable partition is inappropriate as it is 
as it significantly impedes the legibility of Frank Lloyd Wright's, Wright's shapes and design. Additionally, the partition also interferes with the store lighting, resulting in a blank and dark space. We asked the applicant to rethink this aspect of the proposal. A solution as simple as lowering the height of the partition to match the point of sale cabinetry would provide staff the necessary space while, while allowing for the full appreciation of this exemplary building and maintain the impact that natural light has in this part of the museum. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Lo van der Velk from Carnegie Hill Neighbors. And I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please unmute your mic and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. My name is Lowe Vanderhoff. I'm representing Carnegie Hill Neighbors. Uh, we're delighted with this application, uh, many aspects of this application. Um, and also we're grateful for the historic perspective of the application showing uh, just what was in existence before the Guatemala Siegel uh, alteration. And we note, for example, that there was a drive-through um, that started at 89th Street and may actually have ended on Fifth Avenue. Well, I'm not clear on that, but uh, certainly Eliminating that drive-through has been a great improvement. The, the store is, is, is a very interesting element of the museum, particularly in the evening hours. The light emanating from the store is, is very welcoming and it has a warm uh, hue to it. And we hope that in this application, uh, account will be taken of the external views from the sidewalk. I know that during the day we have vendors cluttering the sidewalk, but after six o'clock and in the evening hours and certain times in the weekends, uh, that's the, the sidewalk space is very open and the view to the, uh, to the museum's entrance and the store are very evident. We have no particular suggestion, but we, we would, we would uh, ask that attention be paid on how it will look from the sidewalk after the restoration has been completed as compared to the current view from the sidewalk, which we think is very salutary. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we do not have any other speakers signed up in advance and I'm not seeing any other hands raised. So I'll note for the record, that Manhattan Community Board 8 recommends denial, noting a lack of correlation between the proposed design of the overall retail space and the museum itself, and finding the proposal to be not contextual with the language of the museum's curvilinear architecture. And we also received one letter of support uh, from Harbo Architects. I'll turn it back to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you very much. So I'd like to turn back to the applicant team and ask if you'd like to respond to the comments. I, uh, yeah, um, I would say to the comment about outside, it has definitely been uh, a big part of our process. Um, obviously, you have to kind of narrow down uh, for these presentations kind of to the highest level bits and pieces, but we've we've definitely thought about what that looks like um, out, out the main store to the left hand side here across the glass and and thought about how our casework is going to emulate the existing casework uh, from more of a distant standpoint. So it, it really should appear to be very similar um, in nature uh, as a guest was to, to walk past from the street view, looking in uh, and see this casework that wraps around the back wall, uh, warming the space. As you said, I, I love that term. It's, and it is so very true. It, it does create, uh, the warmth of the room within this sort of this white um, envelope. So yes, that that's very important to us and it is something we continue to look at. Thank you. All right, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any final questions? All right, not seeing any questions. I'm sending you all requests to unmute.
so we can have a discussion. All right, Commissioner Gustafson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Devonshire, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we will now begin our discussion. And I wanna thank the applicants for a clear presentation. I think that the, the site, site plan is unusual due to its very distinctive design. And so I think it can be hard to visualize all components here, but uh, hopefully the commission understands the location um, that we're working in that has evolved over time and the proposal and has been enclosed over time. And this proposal is to change out uh, fixtures that were installed during the Guatemi Siegel renovation and replace them with different fixtures in a similar wood town. Um, so we will uh, begin that discussion. Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you like to start? Hey, okay. Um, well, you know, I have never been um, a supporter of the additions um, that were made to the building. I, I've felt like so many of them have um, really not taken sort of the information of the existing and historic building into account enough. On the other hand, the decisions that were made were always um, either a little bit too backdrop or a little bit too much like what they thought the interpretation of the building should be. So I, it's, it's always been a struggle for me. Um, I, I, and so I've never, and, and yet the interior elements of the original building are so extraordinary and so special and so unique, um, you know, that when we are back onto interior conditions, um, you know, you, one would want for them to, in some way, speak to the to the other um, interior spaces that were the Franklin Wright designs. What am I saying? I'm saying that the, the that the stuff that was actually landmarked as interior was not um, the kind of the really some of the really important stuff. It was the, some of the newer stuff that we're looking at. And so, um, given the fact that I've never liked it very much in in, in the at all, um, I I suppose that the proposal that's before us today is acceptable, um, but I think it, again, is not necessarily in keeping with the original um, interior conditions of the original building, but that's not what we're looking at. So, so long-winded and not clear. Um, I, I, I feel that these are appropriate given the fact that they're second generation, uh, third generation now and not the most vital and important interior spaces. And so I think I can approve these, but am sort of have always been uncomfortable with, with these kind of newer interstitial spaces. So appropriate. Okay, all right, thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, as um, I, I as a frequent uh, visitor to the museum and the uh, store, I think these these changes are great uh, on the in the existing situation. Uh, I think that uh, using uh, the right furniture is furnishings as an example, and using these warm tones and the way they've you know the fact that they're movable are all very good elements for the music, the shop itself. And I think it, it just presents just much nicer uh, and gives you a little more appreciation of the, uh, the, orig the original features that, well, original and well, you see uh, Siegel features that are there. And I've been in that cul-de-sac many times. You go, you wander in there as you're looking to, you know, find a place See if there's something in the in the shop you missed, and it is a very uncomfortable and and not very attractive space. And I think it's a, it's a great idea that you know to use it for back of uh, office space and and use the uh, set up the uh, purchasing area in another place. So I think uh, in the, in this existing situation that this is a, a very good uh, uh, modification of the uh, some of the intern interior furniture here and uh, even the and the 
interior circulation of this particular. So I can approve it uh, enthusiastically. Thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Yeah. Um, I uh, think it's generally an improvement over what came before it, in, in primarily in that it seems to free up the uh, the uh, original Frank Lloyd Wright column. Um, it doesn't propose encumbering that. Um, I think that the other changes are fairly decorative and of relatively low stakes. I do find the uh, that kind of feature wall with the, with the boxes a bit busy and, and kind of distracting from the, from the architecture of the, of the building, but I don't think it's inappropriate. Okay. Commissioner Devonshire? I think it's appropriate as presented. Commissioner Chen? I agree with the, uh, the rest of the commissioners. Commissioner Bland? Sorry, improvement, therefore appropriate. Commissioner Jefferson? Um, a refresh, and I can approve it. Commissioner Gustafson? Appropriate as is. Okay, great. So I think we have a consensus to support. Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you be comfortable making the motion? Sure, no problem. Uh, in the matter of LPC 2212330, Fifth Avenue, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum Interior Landmark and expanded Carnegie Hill Historic District, a modern style museum building designed by Frank Lloyd Wright and built in 1956 to 59, subsequently enlarged by an addition designed by Guathmi Siegel and Associates and built in 1988 to 92. The applications to modify designated interior spaces. I recommend approval finding that the area where the bookstore is located was originally a covered driveway, which was enclosed during renovations in the mid 1970s and then enlarged and furnished as part of a Guathmi Siegel addition in the early 1990s. And therefore the proposed work will not eliminate damage or conceal any significant architectural features. The installations including shelving and desk displays, uh, display tables and freestanding partition are in keeping with the area's auxiliary use supporting museum and are reversible in nature. But the wood material of the proposed installations is neutral in color and of high quality and will be in keeping with the materials found throughout the rest of the designated interior spaces. That the design and scale of the installations are simple and modest and the partition will not extend all the way to the ceiling. Therefore, they will not detract from the character of the interior space. That the application of translucent film at a portion of the north window wall is reversible, will still allow natural light to enter the space and will be consistent in appearance with the existing obscured visibility with the existing obscured visibility at the window wall. Therefore, it will not detract from the significant features of the exterior or designated spaces in the interior of this building. Thank you. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. Sarah, should I call the roll? Yes. Uh, Chair Carroll. Can't hear you. Mark? Yeah, can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Oh, sorry, I don't know what's going on. Did you Chair call Carroll. me? Yes, yeah. I did. Chair Aye. Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. With nine in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. That's approved. Thank you. Good luck. And we'll now move to the next item on the agenda. The next item is item number eight, docket number 22-11940. 245 West 138th Street in the St. Nicholas Historic District, Borough Manhattan, Block 2024, Lot 13, an application for a certificate of appropriateness. A Neo-Georgian style row house designed by Bruce Price and Clarence S. Luce and built in 1891 to 92. And the application is to remove a freestanding wall and construct a garage and deck. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing and the staff will take you through the presentation. Good afternoon, Commissioners, Michelle Crair and Preservation staff. The item before you today is for work at 245 West 138th Street in the St. Nicholas Historic District. The building is located mid-block 
um, on the north side of the street between Adam Clayton Powell and Frederick Douglass Boulevards. This work was initially reviewed and approved by the commission at the public hearing of July 14th, 2015, and a certificate of appropriateness was subsequently issued. However, that expired in July of 2021 without the work having been commenced. This proposal is for the exact same scope of work that was presented and approved in 2015. Um, the proposed work is located at the rear of the building, which fronts on a private shared drive, which is not a public thoroughfare, and is closed to the public by a metal gate. As you can see in these photos, there are numerous garages along the length of the drive, as well as some garden walls and fences. Here, at the, here in the top photo, you can see additional context as seen from the subject property. The height and features of the garages and rear yards vary throughout the block. The proposal is to, de to demolish the existing wall at the rear of the property lot line and construct a garage with a roof deck. The garage will not be visible from public thoroughfares. However, um, it cannot be reviewed at the staff level since it extends to the rear lot line. And this is the property right here. Um, here's another view of the existing conditions. On the bottom, a rendering of the proposal showing the new brick garage structure with a brick parapet to act as the safety railing for the above deck and a paneled metal garage door. Oops. Um, as you can see in this slide, a majority of the buildings on the block have had garages added over time, represented by the beige color. The subject property is highlighted in red. Additionally, here are several more photos of existing garages throughout the block. And here are some existing, um, additional existing photos of the conditions at the rear yard and existing and proposed floor plan drawings. Existing elevations of the rear and front facades and side, and then proposed elevations. The brick will be chosen to match the existing secondary facade bricks at the house with a neutral colored garage door to match the stone lintels at the rear facade. And lastly, the elevation in context with, oops, sorry, the section. <laughs> section drawings existing elevations, and then lastly, um, the, oops, too far, <laughs> the proposed uh, elevation in context with the adjacent buildings. This is the subject property here in the center. The project applicant is here to answer any questions. Thank you. Oh, you're muted, sir. Thank Got you, it. Michelle. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, let's move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sonia Gior to take us through that testimony. Great, thank you. Um, so we do have a sign up in advance, Michelle Arbelou from the Historic Districts Council. And Michelle, if you could unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Michelle Arbelou for the Historic Districts Council. HDC finds this proposed garage poorly proportioned and lacking in articulation and detail. We believe the architect has an opportunity to produce something a bit more elegant, simple, but concerted. Thank you. Thank you. And we do not have any other signups in advance. And I don't see any other hands raised. So I'll note that Manhattan Community Board 10 recommends approval. And we also received a letter of support um, from the local Strivers Row Block Association. I'll turn it back to you, Chair Carroll. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to turn to the applicant, Ms. Adair, and see if you'd like to respond to the comments. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya Adair with Splice Design. The idea for the, the rear facade of the garage is, as stated before, this is part of a series of garages and walls that create a datum line for a, a rear alley access way. And what we wanted to, to do was keep it simple and understated with the inspiration of the coloration of the, the brick that is on the rear of these facades and in keeping with other facades as well. Um, what we have done is try to articulate with how the bricks are actually being laid above the garage door, and then also a stone cap um, to give slight articulation to the rear facade, but nothing that would be ostentatious. So that was our general idea. 
Okay, thank you. All right, and commissioners, any final questions? All right, I'm gonna start sending you requests to unmute so we can begin our discussion. All right, and Commissioner Bland, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you, and Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, hearing is closed. Um, and as Michelle presented, this is an application that the commission previously approved and um, has, it's expired for the work to be done. And so this is, they're back today for a reauthorization. Um, we have seen a number of garages and walls in the backyards of the houses in Strivers Row. And there is a, um, you know, a mix of conditions, many of them having garages of various shapes, sizes, and materials, and some having walls, and some having rear extensions of, from their building coming straight out. And sometimes that's combined with an addition. Um, so I think given the context in the past, the commission um, approved this um, finding that it fit within that context. So we will uh, have that conversation again uh, now that we're being asked to reauthorize that. Commissioner Chapin, would you like to start this one? Uh, sure. Um, I think it's a simple design that's appropriate and, and uh, similar to other garages along the uh, the alleyway there. And uh, as you pointed out, the height varies. I think it's sort of creative that some of them use the top of the garage for a, a sort of sitting area. And uh, I can approve it as presented. I don't, I don't have any problem with it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. I agree with, with Diana. Okay, Commissioner Devonshire. I do as well. Commissioner Chen. Uh, same here. Okay. And uh, Commissioner Bland. Um, I agree, and I thank Tonya Adair for her articulate um, defense of the scheme. Thank you, Tonya. And Commissioner Jefferson? I agree. Commissioner Gustafson? I think it's funny that the, uh, the only reason that it's before us is that it reaches the lot line, and that's probably the very most important fact about it is that uh, with all the inconsistency in that, uh, in that alley, um, the bringing it out to the lot line is what makes it consistent. So, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, appropriate as is. Thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I agree. It's appropriate. Okay. All right. So I think we're all in agreement. Commissioner Chapin, would you make the motion? Okay. Thank you. In the matter of C to certificate of appropriateness for old Manhattan LPC 221940. 245 West 138th Street, St. Nicholas Historic District, a neo-Georgian style row house designed by Bruce Price and Clarence S. Luce and built in 1891 to 92. Application is to remove a freestanding wall and construct a garage and deck. I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the St. Nicholas Historic District. I further note that the work was previously approved and that certificate of appropriateness has elapsed and the same scope of work is being filed for now. I recommend approval finding that the demolition of the utilitarian masonry wall will not eliminate any significant historic fabric, but simply designed garages have been added to the majority of the rear yards at this block. Therefore, the presence of this garage will be in keeping with changes made to the block over time. But the proposed garage will not be visible from any public thoroughfare. But the materials, finishes, and simple detailing of the garage will be in keeping with such aspects of garages throughout the row and will be com compatible with the design and character of the secondary uh, rear facade and L of the house. But the height of the garage, although taller than the immediately adjacent garages, will be in keeping within the typical range of heights of garages within this block and will not overwhelm the house, lot, or row. And the work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building or the St. Nicholas Historic District. Thank you, Commissioner Goldblum. Would you second that motion? Second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. 
Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. With nine in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. That's approved. Thank you. And we'll move to the next item. The next item is item number nine, uh, an application for a certificate of appropriateness, docket number LPC 22-11571, 136 Walcott Avenue in the New York City Farm Colony Seaview Hospital Historic District in the borough of Staten Island, block 1975, lot 536, a freestanding house built circa 1970. The application is to alter the facades, enlarge the building and construct a garage. I'm sorry, I'm experiencing some technical difficulties. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Willie Yuen. I'm the architect for this project. And uh, 156 Walcott is uh, a landmark uh, in a landmark district. It's in uh, the uh, historic uh, New York City Farm Colony, Seaview Hospital. And we're proposing uh, an enlargement on the house, plus also the, a garage on the, the rear portion of the property. And, uh, I, I really photo here. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll continue okay. on now that we've got the uh, presentation sure. sorted out. Hi, Richard. Hi. Okay, so good afternoon, uh, Commissioners Richard Lowry, uh, Preservation Staff. Um, I'll be presenting the proposal, and uh, the architect, uh, Willie Ewan, will be here to answer any questions. Seems to be a delay and Abby, can you control the advancing of the slides? I'm seeming to have an issue. So Richard, you, you I think she may be having some technical issues if you have, um... I, I can actually maybe share the presentation instead. Just a minute. Richard, if you want to try. That. Okay, again, there's some lag. Let me just get to the beginning of the presentation. Okay. Um, so as mentioned, uh, as at 136 uh, Walcott Avenue is Staten Island. 
Um, it's within uh, the New York City Farm Colony Seaview Hospital Historic District. It's uh, the subject house is in a row of houses that are on the western periphery of the western section of the historic district. There's an eastern section on the other side of Brielle Avenue. Now the area in red is where this uh, row of houses is located. Um, and as you can see from the map from the designation report, uh, these houses are not shown. Um, the uh, buildings uh, were all constructed uh, between 1968 to 1970, uh, which is about 11 years prior to the designation of the historic district. Uh, but when the designation report was prepared, uh, these houses are not mentioned. Um, so we are uh, considering these as, as non-contributing buildings uh, to the property. And I'll just jump in, commissioners. Many of you have been to the site as we did do, uh, we approved a significant project here and you know that it's a very large landscaped site uh, and planted and naturalistic site. And I, I think it's very possible that, that the commission didn't know that these buildings were even within the boundaries because they're so far in the periphery and you don't see them from within the grounds. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Yes, uh, it's approximately from sort of the public thoroughfares, it's about uh, almost 1,100 feet until you get to these houses from the sort of uh, the historic precinct proper. Uh, there's a low uh, hillock uh, in between um, the two areas of buildings. Uh, it rises up and then slopes uh, down, and then there's sort of rocky outcrops uh, the closer you get to Walcott Avenue. Um, it's uh, sort of heavily forested with deciduous trees. And we'll get to the next slide. Uh, here's the site plan. And this is one of the, I think the only single story house in this row. Everyone, every other house um, is a two story house. Uh, there are about five detached garages in the uh, rear yards of these uh, houses on this row, as well as pools and other structures. Uh, this is just a simple uh, single story house with a, a sort of cellar. And just get you some shots um, uh, of the surrounding area. And you can see the forest in the background. And then the rear yard where the uh, So the proposal, as you can see from the zoning axon, um, is to uh, add a, a second story and an attic space, as well as to add a detached garage at the back. Uh, just uh, the floor plans. Uh, and also to do some alterations to the facades. Um, as I discussed, uh, the buildings were all built uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. So there's no historic material, uh, no significant architecture, and it's again considered as a, a non-contributing building. Um, here is just a streetscape uh, photograph with a photo montage of the development uh, set into the streetscape. Uh, and I think these are quite telling, again, as, as Sarah discussed, um, these are taken uh, about uh, March this year, uh, so all the leaves are off the trees, and you can see that there is, uh, you know, the, the hillock and the trees between, you know, looking from the Walcott Avenue back towards the historic precinct. Sorry. And then this is from the sort of historic precinct, as you can see on the left-hand side, looking back towards Walcott Avenue. So um, there's, uh, I said, quite a bit of, of landscaping and forest and hills, uh, hillocks uh, in between the two. Um, so I'll turn it over to uh, Willie Ewan, uh, the architect, to answer any questions the commissioners may have. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Richard. Uh, so commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, let's move to public testimony and then we'll regroup after that and see if we have other questions. If you're in the meeting and would like to testify, please raise your hand so we can identify you and I'll turn it over to Sonia to take us through the testimony. Thank you. So we do have one sign up in advance, Michelle Arbelu. Michelle, I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please unmute your mic and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, Michelle Arvlu for the Historic Districts Council. HTC finds this proposal inappropriate. The building is too bulky and the materials are too varied. A smaller two-story brick building would be a better neighbor. Thank you. Thank you. And we do not have any other signups in advance. And so I will note for the record that Staten Island Community Board 2 recommends approval. I'll turn it back to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Ewan, is there anything you'd like to say before we move to our discussion? Yeah, um, I just want to uh, let the uh, board know or the landmark people know that uh, it's within the confine of the zoning resolution as far as the zoning envelope. Everything is within the height limitation. Uh, the uh, photo montage might be deceiving because we're I'm not expert in doing the 3D. So it should be uh, more set in and more uh, within the configuration. In the uh, zoning uh, diagram, we show that that's within the uh, envelope. Thank you. Thank you. And commissioners, if there are no final questions, I'm gonna send you all requests to unmute so that we can close the hearing and have our discussion. All right, Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and We'll begin our discussion, and this um, is again, as we've said, is a very sort of large rural uh, historic district that is very wooded. And um, this set of buildings, while constructed in the 1960s and 70s, uh, are not evident in our subsequent designation report, either in the text or on the map. And because they are such a great distance away through the woods and over the hills. Um, there is no visual connection between these buildings and the buildings within the historic district. And I think, as I said, it may have been an error that we didn't realize these were part of the same part within that boundary. Um, so, but nonetheless, we have an application for it and it is for us. And so we are treating these as non-contributing buildings as they don't relate to the period of the historic district and are not visually connected in any way. Um, so, and the applicant is seeking a approval to expand this house. Commissioner Gustafson, would you like to start this one? What a surprise. Uh... <laughs> I'd have to think that if we designated this district today, um, that we would have carved these houses out of the district. Um, there are perhaps um, 150,000 houses that look just like this one um, all across Staten Island. So the entire borough would be designated. Um, uh, it, it, this is not obviously not a contributing structure. Um, and uh, uh, there is, um, I can't even imagine a basis for objecting to this. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm fine with it. Okay. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I'm in agreement. I feel the same way. And um, I think it's uh, what they're proposing is appropriate. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yes, uh, I agree. I'm just looking at some pictures from 2019 of the farm colony, but anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, I think it's fine. Probably the ends where it is because of where it is. That's fine. Commissioner Goldblum. No disagreement. I, I do think, however, that we should either talk with Mark about either putting it up for a vote to reduce the size of the of the designation, 
yes. or to put in place some kind of rule that would allow these folks to get approved at a staff level. It just seems onerous to make every one of the neighbors uh, go through this if we really have no uh, skin in the game, so to speak. So I agree. I agree too. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. I agree too. Okay. Commissioner Chen. Me three. Commissioner Blad. Me four, but also, <laughs> but also with Michael uh, Goldblum's suggestion and uh, Sarah, your seconding of let's remove this. This is onerous and sort of ridiculous. Great. And Commissioner Jefferson. I'm in agreement. All right. So I think we're all in agreement. Commissioner Gustafson, would you make the motion? Um, yeah, sure. Before before I do, I also want to thank the applicant and uh, and, and Willie yeah. for actually bringing it to us and not just um, going ahead without us because who would have known? Yes. Um, the uh, in the matter of LPC twenty two one one five seven one one thirty six Walcott Avenue, New York City Farm Colony, Seaview Hospital Historic District. The application is to alter the facades, enlarge the building, and construct a garage. Um, I know that the existing modern house is not a building for which the New York City Farm Colony Seaview Hospital Historic District was designated. I recommend approval, finding that the building is visually disconnected from the historic precinct and contributing buildings of the New York City Farm Colony Seaview Hospital Historic District, and that the proposed work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features of the historic district, and that the building's enlargement will not detract from the special architectural or historic character of the New York City Farm Colony Seaview Hospital Historic District. Thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? I'm sorry, second. Thank you. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. With nine in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. All right, that's approved. Thank you. And we'll move to the next item. Um, commissioners will now be moving to our public meeting agenda. And the first item on uh, that agenda is uh, Item number one, it's docket number 22-11104, 65 Jamel Terrace in the Morris Jamel Mansion Individual and Interior Landmark. And uh, it, it's an individual and interior landmark, and it's also in the Jamel Terrace Historic District in the Borough of Manhattan, Block 2109, Lot 106. This is an application for a binding report. A Georgian style mansion built in 1765 and remodeled in 1810 in the Napoleonic Empire style with federal style details. Application is to provide barrier-free access to the building and replace rooftop railings. And this was read into the record on July 19th, 2022. Okay, Commissioner, sorry about the previous <laughs> issues. Um, the applicants have entered the hearing. Eric, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen and state your name for the record. And you can advance the slides okay, using well, your arrow keys. Before oh, yeah. we begin, right, this item was read into the record, so we need to make a motion to open the hearing so that they can present and we can take, take public testimony. So, uh, Commissioner Gustafson, would you make a motion to open the hearing? Uh, uh, so moved, but also you have to uh, recuse a couple of people. Yes, that is true. And so commis moved. Commissioner uh, Devonshire, uh, Commissioner Devonshire, would you second the motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and I will note that Commissioner Chapin and Commissioner Goldblum are recused on this item and not present. Okay, okay you may begin now. Okay, good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Eric DeFranzo, Paige Harris Collier Architects. Um, we're here today to present our project at the Morris Jamel Mansion, which is a part of a, a New York City Parks Department capital project, uh, which is managed through the sole source agreement with the Historic House Trust. Um, we're presenting a proposal for ADA access to the first floor of the building, um, as well as upgrade of the first floor restroom and replacement of missing uh, railings at the rooftop. The project also will include a uh, complete exterior restoration, which will be a separate application level. 
Um, also, uh, so the Morris Jamel Mansion was uh, built in 1765. It's the oldest surviving house in Manhattan. Uh, it was built for Roger Morris, a uh, British colonel during the revolution and briefly served as Washington's headquarters in 1776. Later was acquired by Stephen and Eliza Jumel in 1810 and then in 1903 by the city of New York. So the, the mansion is located in Roger Morris Park, which is in uh, Washington Heights, just off of Edgecombe Avenue in Upper Manhattan. On the right is a site plan of the park with uh, the mansion located centrally in the park and the park entrance to the west off of Jumel Terrace. Uh, the primary uh, elevation at the south of the mansion. Um, and as you can see in the site plan, there are uh, brick uh, circulation paths uh, throughout the park. So the landmark site encompasses the entirety of Roger Morris Park and it um, also within the boundaries of the uh, Jumel Terrace Historic District, which was designated in uh, 1970. The mansion was designated in 1967 as an individual landmark. And we have some images of the house, uh, some historic images on the top left, uh, an image from 1904. Uh, of the primary south elevation showing the entrance portico and porch. Uh, the bottom left is a very early engraving uh, which shows the roof railings which are presently missing uh, both at the main block of the mansion, uh, the octagon wing at the north as well as the hyphen connector in between. And then on the right is a later image from 1915 showing the uh, uh, roof railings that were removed sometime around 1903. Here's a, an enlarged existing site plan. As I mentioned, the park entrance is at the, the west side of the park. Um, the main block of the house and the uh, entrance uh, porch and portico are here at the south, the hyphen connector in the center and octagon wing to the north. Um, all of the pedestrian walking paths that lead up to entrances to the mansion at the east, west, and south are uh, paved in bluestone. The walking paths throughout the park are uh, brick paved walking paths. Some images of uh, some existing uh, context images here. On the top left is the existing park entrance. Uh, and the top center is just inside the entranceway showing uh, the brick pathways there. On the right side is uh, the bluestone walking path that leads up to the west entrance of the park, which is presently not accessible uh, from the park entrance. Bottom left is a view facing towards the west of the bluestone plaza that's at the south uh, main entrance of, of the mansion. And then bottom center is a view of that entrance at the south side. So our um, design process here uh, was to study different ways to make the front, uh, make the uh, main floor of the mansion accessible to the visiting public. We studied several different options for doing so, uh, including at the south uh, main entrance, uh, which we ultimately determined was not appropriate due to the level of intervention required, which I'll explain in a, in a later slide. We also looked at the west entrance, um, which we ultimately ruled as not appropriate because it would be a highly visible uh, location just across from the entrance to the park. We looked at uh, options for approaching from the north as well as from the south. We ultimately decided that it would be more appropriate for uh, visitors uh, entering the park to be able to come into the entrance and circulate around the, the mansion, experience the mansion from, from all angles as they approach the entrance, which we located here on the east uh, side of the building. And um, we've had discussions with uh, the Parks Department as well as museum staff that this uh, entrance would be made available to all visitors, not just to wheelchair visitors as well. So the main entrance would remain active 
uh, for visiting groups, everyone would use the entrance here on the east side of the building. Um, so part of this proposal is to modify the west porch uh, to extend it out to create a wheelchair accessible landing at the top of the ramp and also to raise it up one step to be level with the interior uh, floor elevation at the hyphen entrance here. We chose to um, create a, a 90 degree uh, configured ramp uh, for two reasons. One of them is the, the section that extends out towards the east off of the porch is configured such that it will allow um, access to the side area off of the, the east elevation here, which there was formerly a stoop leading to an entrance door at the side, which no longer exists, but we don't wanna preclude that from happening in the future. It's been discussed that that may be something that will be part of a future capital project. So we're maintaining access to that location. Also, we wanted to minimize the length of the ramp uh, coming down um, towards the south. And we have some constraints with the topology of the park and some, some high rock outcroppings at the area um, east of the, the mansion in the park at this location here. So what we're proposing is to eliminate a portion of the existing walking paths, which is the light shaded uh, beige color in this area here, and reroute that walking path slightly to the east to allow the ramp to, to be located where it's shown. And then there will be an additional uh, bluestone walking path leading up to the porch entrance on the east side to maintain the relationship of the paving materials that lead to the entrances of the mansion, as opposed to the walking paths that circulate around the park. Here are some context photos of the proposed location on the top uh, left. You're facing towards the southwest at the location of the proposed ramp. Some of the obstacles we have here are the uh, crepe myrtle tree, which is located in the proximity to where the ramp will be located. There's also a hatchway that leads to the basement um, just to the north of the uh, east porch. On the bottom left, you can see um, the building has a uh, perimeter, a stone uh, gutter system uh, around the entire perimeter. Uh, there aren't any gutters um, up above at the roof. So this system is designed to divert rainwater away from the building, which drips from above. And then on the right side, you can see the existing brick walking path, which we'll we be reconfiguring, pushing that slightly out to the, to the east to make way for the accessible approach and the access ramp to the east entrance. These are some images of um, the south porch, uh, the main staircase to the, to the entrance. Um, the image on the left, you can see the porch has quite a bit of a slope to it for drainage. This slope exceeds what would be allowable for an ADA approach to an entrance. So if we were to consider the, the main south porch as an accessible pathway, it would have to be reconfigured in, in some way to uh, decrease that, that pitch. We also have an additional step up at the main entrance door, which would require the addition of um, some sort of ramp to navigate that step on top of the porch. So we ultimately decided that this was going to be a um, too much of an intervention on such a prominent location on the mansion and, and decided that the east elevation would be the more appropriate um, place for accessibility. There's some images of the east side um, from uh, looking back from the eastern end of the park. And then an enlarged photo of the proposed location of the ramp. Um, and you can also see that, uh, that side entrance uh, door, which presently leads to uh, the, the restroom and the interior, which we're making accessible. Um, the ramp will be, you know, as I mentioned, uh, configured so that access to that doorway could be um, maintained if that uh, porch stoop gets reconstructed as part of a future capital project. You can also see in this image, there's some remnants of the roof railings that were in place at the time, which have since been removed because they were severely deteriorated and they were presenting a safety concern. Some pieces of them fell off the roof. So the parks department had them removed recently which uh, allowed us to actually get our hands on them and verify some of the profiles and dimensions and record them for replication purposes. 
but presently there are no railings in existence on the roof at this time. And then um, some some details of uh, on the left side the approach to the west uh, sorry the east porch in the center looking back along the brick pathway adjacent to the secondary entrance on the east side and then a detail from uh, head on at that entranceway. Here's an enlarged uh, plan uh, just showing in a little bit more detail the proposal so as I mentioned the east porch will be extended out approximately 14 inches um, and raised up to match the interior floor level. We'll be constructing a new set of steps for uh, visitor access to that porch and then the ramp which extends out to the east. Uh, the bluestone pathway in this location is new, uh, will be is proposed to be new, um, and we're maintaining uh, existing brick pathway to the uh, basement hatchway uh, that goes underneath the octagon wing. All of the uh, paving materials will be uh, proposed to match existing. We, we'll be able to salvage some of the brick uh, from the existing pathways in the reconstruction of this pathway here. And also um, this plan also shows the proposed reconfiguration of that uh, ground floor restroom for ADA accessibility. This is the proposed east elevation and existing at the top. Um, you can see the uh, roof railings here that we're proposing. Um, we're proposing to replicate them in a composite wood material, which is um, wood fibers with binders and polymers to, to match uh, the, uh, an appearance identical to that of painted wood. Um, so we're proposing that for the uh, octagon roof, the main block, as well as the railings at the hyphen. As I mentioned, we were able to survey some of the remaining components of that railing before it was removed from the octagon wing. So the details of that will, will match uh, all of the profiles and sizing of, of that assembly. Unfortunately, the hyphen railings were no longer in existence, but we were able to uh, base the design on historic photographs, as well as there's some scarring on the side of the building. So we were able to measure the height of that to, to match um, the design to be appropriate for that location. Uh, the, the ramp on the east side, which will be approximately 20 foot and 20 foot six inches, and the, the new set of stairs leading to the east porch here. We're also proposing uh, we have to light the location for the accessible entrance. So one, um, one light fixture above that eastern entrance uh, beneath the porch overhang of that location. This is the north elevation existing and proposed showing side view of the proposed steps to the east porch, railings at the upper roof, um, and looking back towards the south at the, the ramp from that vantage point. There's a section through the hyphen showing how the porch would be reconfigured um, to be uh, raised up to match that interior floor level and extended out uh, for that accessible landing in that location. South elevation uh, here, we're showing the uh, replication of the missing roof railings. And finally, on the west elevation, uh, the reconstruction of the hyphen rail and upper roof railings. Here's some uh, photographs which we use for replication purposes. Um, the top right image is one of the earliest known depictions of the mansion, um, showing the railings in all three locations. Um, we use this image as well as others uh, in developing the design for the railings. On the bottom left, um, this is the second iteration of the railings, which were um, missing. Uh, they were believed to be removed around 1903 and construct, reconstructed again in the 1930s. So the image here on the bottom left is from the Olmsted archives showing that configuration at the time. Uh, and then on the bottom right is another uh, from the 1930s showing the railings on the upper roof. 
And then the hyphen railings as well. Um, we have photographs from the 1930s uh, showing uh, the configuration of that railing. And then a very early photograph from uh, an engraving from 1876 uh, showing all three uh, locations. There's a detail for both of the assemblies. Um, this is based on, uh, for the roof railings, based on the existing fabric that we were able to survey, as well as uh, the historic photographs. We're going to be reusing existing uh, stainless steel uh, mounting flanges, which are in existence at the roof. Um, and when the railings were removed, uh, these, these flanges basically are recessed into the base of the uh, post and it provides a way to conceal the fastening of that assembly. Uh, so those remain and we will be reusing those to uh, install the new railings up on the main roof. And then the hyphen railing here, the height here of three foot six is based on the scarring, as I mentioned on the side of the building that we were able to survey. Uh, this is uh, some images of the sample of the material that we're proposing um for the upper roof um, as well as for the ramp uh, it's a composite wood material as i mentioned with wood fibers and binders and um, it has an appearance identical to that of painted wood um, this will also allow us since we have to light the area of the ramp to um, conceal some lighting fixtures within the railing assembly and avoid having to um, mount any additional lighting and on the building or in the adjacent park uh, for that accessible approach to the entrance. On the bottom left is um, the proposed, it's the same uh, material that we're proposing for the decking of the ramp. Um, and then the two images on the bottom right are examples of this type of railing and installed in other applications. Here's a rendering of the proposed reconfiguration of the brick pathway and the ramp uh, facing north from the Bluestone Plaza at the south end. And then another railing from the east uh, facing west showing the, how the ramp would be configured, uh, the new Bluestone pathway leading up to the entranceway and the replicated railings at all the locations. Um, now we, um, we chose the uh, material for the replicated roof railings um, due to uh, the, the need to find a material that would be able to be virtually identical to the appearance of painted wood in keeping with the material palette of the, the mansion. Um, but also maintenance has been a very real concern at the, uh, at the mansion. Access to these railings is very difficult and um, they haven't been able to, you know, maintain them. Cyclical maintenance would require, you know, a lift or scaffolding, um, you know, painting it every few years. Um, if we were to do this in natural wood, would um, not be something that the Parks Department has the ability to maintain uh, in the future. For the ramp, um, we studied several different uh, options for the materials that we're using here, and we ultimately decided that while we did not want to um, replicate any historic details or ornamentation of the building, we wanted to choose something that was in keeping with the overall material palette um, of the historic mansion, rather than do something more contemporary, which we think may be appropriate in some settings, but in this case would really detract from the historic setting of the mansion in the park. Um, and also, uh, we considered, you know, looking at um, some iron railings, which you can see at the basement stairs, there's some iron here. However, that's a very um, recent intervention to the mansion and there aren't any iron components um, that are original to the building and it's a, a foreign material to the, to the overall uh, palette of the mansion. So we think what we're proposing is um, in keeping with that historic materials palette, uh, but not, um, you know, not trying to, to replicate any um, historic detailing here, just a simple, simple design, keeping in context with the color palette, material palette, and uh, the appearance of natural wood. 
Okay, thank you very much. We do have at least one question. Commissioner Bland, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, wondered if you had considered um, a scheme where you raise the level of the ground uh, somewhat uh, and instead of having a ramp with rails mm -hmm. had a one in 20 ramp, which would not require any rails at all. We, we did look at that possibility um, and we are in fact going to be doing some regrading to minimize the overall length of the ramp. Um, but in, in looking at, uh, you know, possible uh, earth ramps or uh, one to 20 slopes, um, ultimately the, the length of the ramp would be much longer than what it is now. Um, so we think we, you know, it, it was a priority of us to try to minimize the footprint of the ramp as much as possible on the site. Uh, and also um, we didn't want to uh, consider too much regrading of the site because the um, within close proximity to the foundations, because they have a lot of uh, moisture infiltration issues and the foundations are deteriorating in some locations and we did not want to exacerbate that condition. Well, I don't want to get into a design uh, debate on how you would do it exactly, because I think you can do it if you raise it on the outside of where the ramp is now, not on the inside and maybe have a wall, a little wall or something. But um, I just asked the question because it seems to me as if the railings, um, while maybe we have to approve them ultimately, if we can't change the design, they are somewhat objectionable to this extraordinarily important uh, early, early house in New York. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Jefferson, please um, go ahead. Just one quick one. In your experience, this composite wood material, how long does it last? Uh, it, it will last indefinitely. Um, you know, the manufacturer state 30 years plus. Um, so that was part of the main, one of the main motivations for, for selecting the material. You know, we wanted to make sure that it, it would have the same appearance as painted wood, but also given the, the very real challenges with, with maintenance and the ability to access these railings up on the roof um, within the park setting, um, it was important to, you know, select a material that achieved both of those goals. Oh, thank you. Okay, other questions? All right, let's move to public testimony. And if you're in the meeting and would like to testify in this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I'll turn it over to Sonia Gior to take us through the testimony. Thank you. So we do have some signups in advance. Our first speaker will be Andrea Goldwyn from the New York Landmarks Conservancy. Andrea, I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please unmute your mic and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Okay, sorry about that. A different system that's taking a minute to set up. Anyway, apologies. Uh, good late afternoon, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. I'm Andrea Goldwyn speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Morris Jamel Mansion is one of the finest landmarks in the city. Predating the Revolutionary War, it's an individual and interior landmark within a city and National Register Historic District and a National Historic Landmark, one of the oldest surviving residences in Manhattan. Images in the application show a worrying lack of maintenance with paint peeling on every facade. Ideally, our priority for the mansion would be to implement a full envelope restoration and establish a long-term maintenance plan. Looking at what we have today, the Conservancy supports the goals of this application, but we have serious concerns about how they would be achieved. Modifications to this landmark have to meet the highest preservation standards. Morris Jamel should have equitable access to ensure that its unique story can be shared with all New Yorkers. However, the proposed ramp detracts from the house's symmetrical design and proportions. The designation report calls the massing superb. Installation of this ramp would severely alter that composition. Given the maintenance concerns, 
we would not recommend adding any new painted wood elements. And given the significance of the building, we would not be inclined to support substitute materials. Instead, we suggest a different approach that the applicants explore installing a lift at the same location at the east porch. The smaller footprint would be more deferential to the landmark and could minimize upkeep. Another option could be a modular metal ramp, which we've seen used successfully at historic religious properties. While visible, it would not be read as part of the historic fabric and would be reversible until a better solution can be determined. Above all, we hope that Mars Jamel will receive the treatment that this landmark deserves. Thank you for the opportunity to express the Conservancy's views. Thank you. Our next speaker will be George Calderaro from the Victorian Society. And George will be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. George Calderaro is speaking for the Victorian Society New York. The overall scheme for access seems appropriate to us as it requires minimal changes to the landscape and leaves the primary architectural entrance alone. The changes to the side porch door and entrance stair to accommodate the ramp will not be visible from many locations on the site and we find them to be in character. We suggest that the existing black metal handrail adjacent to the proposal ramp may be, be a better model for the ramp's design. Slide 24 shows how much less intrusive this existing rail is than the proposed heavy white ramp railing. We also ask the commission to investigate the irregular paving stones visible in picture 13 on slide 12. If these pavers are historic, they should be salvaged and reused. Regarding the restoration of roof railings, the Victorian Society supports the use of substitute materials in many situations. An 18th century historic house is not one of them. The material proposed is disingenuously called, quote, wood composite. In fact, it's wood powder mixed with resin, in other words, plastic. The other, and other than the wood deck, it's wrapped in molded PVC, the same material as vinyl siding. We would be opposed even if it could made to, be made to look exactly like wood with a painted finish, which we doubt it can. PVC is an ecological disaster and has no place on an 18th century historic house. We, re we recommend acetylated wood, a safe, sustainable, long lasting real wood option. The broader issues raised by this project is the appalling level of stewardship of the city's historic houses by the Department of Parks and Cultural Affairs and the Historic House Trust, which was begun with such high hopes in 1989. Morris Jumel was fully and beautifully restored in the 1990s, yet today it is severely deteriorated with roof railings literally falling off onto the grounds. The situation at New York's publicly owned historic houses is dire, as a visit to most of them will attest. You saw the same situation at the Dykeman House in the last hearing, and we documented the same a few months ago at Litchfield Villa. Commissioners, these houses receive no preventive maintenance, preventative maintenance from the city. This continuing cycle of expensive capital projects followed by the deterioration results in the waste of public funds, loss of historic fabric and conditions at the houses that are an embarrassment and unlike anything we've witnessed in other cities that hold historic houses in public trust. Greater efficiencies or change in priorities might direct more funds to the physical maintenance of these houses, but there's clearly a lack of funds allocated to the city's annual expense budget. We urge the commission to use its authority as a protector of the city's historic architectural and cultural heritage to take on the challenge of documenting the problem and recommending solutions. Section 25-320 of the administrative code gives the commission authority to quote, make investigations and studies of matters relating to protection, enhan enhancement, perpetuation, or use of landmarks. A resulting report with the imprimatur of the Landmarks Commission could generate serious discussion on this issue. We can guarantee that every historic preservation organization, including ours, in the city would fully and vocally support the commission in such an effort. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, our next speaker will be Michelle Arbelou. Michelle, I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And if you can please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you, Michelle Arbelou for the Historic Districts Council. HCC is generally in support of this proposal, but we find two items to be in need of further consideration and study. The ADA ramp would be less noticeable and blend more with its surroundings if it were executed in black painted steel, similar to the guardrails currently located at the stair to the cellar that is directly adjacent to the proposed ramp location. We also find that changing the brick path on the east side of the house from straight to winding creates an awkward interface with the new ADA ramp. It appears to us that these two elements deserve further study and refinement. While we generally feel that real wood is a superior material to composite wood, we may in this case be comfortable with this application given its distance above ground. However, we would ask LPC to verify with the applicant that the composite material is paintable and that the applicant be required to apply the paint to the roof railing system with a brush. So it reads from afar as being painted wood, not shiny plastic. Thank you. Thank you. So we do not have any additional signups, but I do see a hand is raised, Evan Sachs. So I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Hi, my name is Evan Sachs. I am a volunteer at the mansion. Um, I wanted to speak to, in support of this plan in large part because they, the Morris Rumel Mansion is such a vital, important part of the community. It's an important historical location. It's an important educational location, and it's an important source of community where there are so, so many events, as many have alluded to previously. It's currently pretty much falling apart, and it very much needs repair such as this and more. And because of how much it does for the community, it really does... Uh, need that ADA accessibility. Everybody in our community, regardless of their disability status, should have access to the house. And it would make it easier on us as volunteers and workers to be able to say, hey, we have this easy way to get you in the house, especially given that the door that we're talking about is currently pretty much a door to nowhere. You'll see, as was mentioned in the presentation, it's a, currently a door into the bathroom with no way to get it in or out. It's just a plain drop off the side of the house. And uh, um, uh, the, it, it, as we can tell from the presentation, it was very well thought out to make for minimal intrusivity. Obviously, an ADA ramp, an accessibility ramp, isn't something that it would happen in the 1800s, but it's a modern day convenience that we very much need. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we do not have any other signups or any other hands raised. So I'll note for the record that Manhattan Community Board 12 recommends approval. And we also received a letter in support from Borough President Mark Levine and we received 15 letters in support and one other letter. And I'll turn it back to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you very much. And I'd like to turn back to Eric and ask if you'd like to respond to the comments we've heard. Yes, thank you. Um, so um, it was suggested that, uh, um, you know, potentially we could have considered a ramp instead of a lift. Um, and we, we did actually consider a ramp, you know, among many other configurations of ramps uh, and uh, locations on the site, um, along, you know, with in discussions with the Historic House Trust. And we, we actually presented a ramp option to uh, the Parks Department Accessibility Committee. You mean a and, lift? You presented uh, sorry, a lift. Sorry, a, a lift, sorry. We presented a lift as well as a ramp to the uh, Parks Department Accessibility Committee, um, some of whom are actually wheelchair users, and they are overwhelmingly uh, in support of a ramp over a lift um, in this case. Um, the other reason uh, a ramp was ultimately ruled out is that um, in, in the event that the ramp requires uh, repairs or maintenance, uh, oftentimes it can go for months or years at a time before the city's contract will get to uh, repairing it, during which time wheelchair users are not able to access the mansion. Um, 
and, and you know that um, along with um, you know feedback from the parks department was primary reason why a, a ramp was uh, uh, ultimately chosen as the solution. Um, in terms of uh, if I stay on this image here, um, the material palette for the uh, railings on the ramp. Um, this image here could be a little bit deceiving because these railings at that stairway that leads down to the basement are not actually code compliant. They're not actually tall enough and the balusters are not spaced uh, close enough together. Um, so we, we looked at you know this as a possibility. Uh, ultimately, it would be a little bit taller than what you see there and um, the, uh, the balusters would be more tightly spaced and as I mentioned earlier, you know, our, our um, ultimate decision was that we wanted to choose a material that was more in keeping with the historic palette of the house. Um, and as far as the substitute material that's proposed for the roof railings, um, you know, maintenance and access is a very real concern at this site. Um, you know, they, um, you know, the railings have been repaired and replaced multiple times. The ones that were recently taken down were deteriorating for quite some time. And, you know, the, the, the site location inside of a park makes it very difficult to access them. Um, so from a distance, these will have the appearance of that of painted wood. And um, yes, they can be painted as well. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any final questions? Not seeing questions. I'm sending you all requests to unmute. All right. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The hearing is closed and we'll now begin our discussion. And so there are, as we've heard in the presentation, two components. One is to um, lift the level of the landing at the door and do a new ramp, wood composite ramp, ramp with wood composite railings. And that would also involve uh, altering the configuration of the brick paving and the um, recreation of the missing balustrades at the rooftops with and other locations with a wood composite material. So we'll begin our discussion. Um, Commissioner Devonshire, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um, uh, after the South Street Seaport Museum, when I went to work for Jan Picorni, this was the first project that I got to work on. That was the 1990s restoration that George so nicely uh, commended. And um, this also was one of the first buildings that Jan studied when he came here from the Czech Republic during the Second World War. So we, we our office has had a, a long history of affection for this building, which is the oldest residence in Manhattan. And uh, I think someone mentioned, you know, if, if I can get on my hobby horse for a second, someone mentioned um, the, the symmetry of it. In fact, we're looking at the east facade, which has three foot long shingles as exterior cladding. On the other side, which faced the King's Road, it was all flushboard. So it was very nice on that side, very rough on this side. And in fact, we had to do a lot of, uh, we had to do a lot of foundation and sill plate work in the 1990s. And we made the contractor save even the hand wrought nails to reuse the hand wrought nails to put the shingles back on. We drove them crazy. We did an authentic restoration of this building. So, um, and, you know, when someone says they want to use a material that's more in keeping with the historic palette of the house, and that material is plastic, composite plastic, I am, I am nearly aghast. So what I would say is, um, I would, as Andrea Goldwyn mentioned, 
I would uh, suggest revisiting the lift possibility and making sure that the contract that you have with the maintenance people who are supposed to take care of these things is followed. You don't let them skate. You, you make them do it. So um, I'm sort of okay with a ramp. I agree with, with all the discussion about the railing on the ramp being iron rather than uh, more plastic. With regard to the roof railings, I spent about two and a half weeks of my life designing the roof railings that were installed in the 1990s, finding the appropriate wood um, and working from all the historic photographs to make sure that these things were historically accurate. I am aghast that anyone would suggest putting plastic on the roof of this one of the most important houses in New York City. And unless um, the hatches at the, on the flat sections of each of these roofs have been somehow sealed shut or have been uh, disappeared, it's quite easy to get to that roof and paint these things every three years or every five years or even every 10 years. It looks like the house hasn't been painted since we redid it in the 1990s. But plastic has no place on this historic building. Thank you, Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I, I uh, sort of uh, um, echoed uh, Vice Chair Blend's uh, sentiment that, uh, you know, the uh, about the uh, the ramp, uh, if there's an alternate way, but uh, if there's not, then I'll defer to the rest of the commissioners. Commissioner Bland. Um, well, to reiterate what I asked as a question, um, I will now suggest that uh, they do study the idea of manipulating the ground plane in a park setting. It would seem to me to be uh, a more malleable <laughs> material uh, to manipulate than to put this uh, plastic uh, railed ramp uh, on top of the land. Uh, I, mean, I don't know the conditions around it exactly, but if, if what we're seeing here is even reasonably accurate, it would seem to me as if that land could be manipulated to at least uh, eliminate the ramp uh, as a one in 12 ramp requiring rails to a one in 20 walkway uh, that would uh, eliminate uh, the need for rails and of course uh, a, um, an L, uh, a lift. So I would request and hope that the uh, applicant might do that. And who can contest wh what Michael Devonshire has just said about wood uh, versus uh, what's being proposed. Uh, this is kind of like our Mount Vernon. So mm -hmm. let's treat it like that. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. I, I agree with everything that's been said before me. Um, the ramp should be restudied and one in 20 makes a lot of sense. And the, the roof uh, railing, should be painted wood, it's just maintenance. I, so I'm in agreement with my fellow commissioners. Okay, Commissioner Gustafson. Uh, I, I, I agree with uh, my fellow commissioners. Uh, I am I'm frankly surprised that the Parks Department has unilaterally declared that um, lifts are inappropriate. Um, it, it's astounding. Um, and uh, but uh, um, so be it. In any event, um, I, I I I do agree with my fellow commissioners. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, um, I also um, am opposed to any plastic material uh, to be used on the roof elements or a ramp. And I agree that if in fact um, the ground can be manipulated and raised, and the slope can be shallower. Um, which wouldn't require this kind of um, 
this kind of ramp and these kinds of railings, uh, that would be so much better. So the whole thing should uh, be reconsidered. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks everybody. So I think that um, where we are is we won't take an action today. I think that the commissioners present have uh, all agreed that they're not comfortable with the composite material on this individual landmark. And with respect to the ramp, I think that there needs to be further study, um, particularly looking at manipulating the grade to allow for less of a ramp or a ramp with that doesn't require the railings or as dense railings by virtue of its height above a, a raised grade. You know, if the grade, grade is raised, the ramp is maybe a little lower. And um, if, if it doesn't exactly help with the ramp itself, at least it might help with the railings. Um, and then I think other comments we've heard is that, you know, if they're still ramp, still required to have railings, I think we've heard a preference for wrought iron, um, but we will ask you to explore all of that and give you an opportunity to come back and present to us um, your, the results of your exploration. All right, thank you and we'll see you soon. Okay, we'll move to the next item. Great. Uh, the next item is item number three, docket number 21-10627, 251 to 253 Fifth Avenue in the Madison Square North Historic District, Borough of Manhattan. Caroline. Caroline, I think you missed one. I think we're on item two. I, I do apologize. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Item number two, docket number LPC 22-12250, 405 West 113th Street, also known as 30 to 34 Morningside Drive. A plant plant and scrimser pavilions for private patients of St. Luke's Hospital in the individual landmark in the borough of Manhattan block. 1866, Lot 2. This is a proposal for an amendment. A French Renaissance revival pavilion-style hospital complex designed by Ernest Flagg and built in 1904 to 06 and 1928 to 29. The application is to amend Certificate of Appropriateness 19-06904 for the modification of the masonry opening. Okay, thank you. And, and before we get started, we'll open the proceedings so the applicants can explain um, the situation here. So Commissioner uh, Devonshire, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So the applicants may uh, begin the, and explain the uh, application to us. Sarah, I'm going to give a real quick intro. Great. Good afternoon, um, Abby Hurlbut, Preservation Staff. The application is to amend a certificate of appropriateness, which was issued in March of 2017, approving a proposal for uh, various amounts of work, um, you know, the construction of additions and dormers to create and modify masonry openings, replace and fill, alter the site. Um, so this individual landmark is comprised of two pavilions, and they're set back centered connector between them. So here's the pavilions and here's the centered connector. Um, and it's bounded on the south by West 113th Street, on the east by Morningside Drive and the north uh, by West 114th Street. So the application, I'm gonna jump ahead to um, the final slide here. Um, the application is to approve existing as-built conditions um, of this masonry opening that was approved um, to be created at the connector, which is set back again between the two pavilions. Um, the commission approved the creation of this opening to align with the, the window above. And the as-built conditions, as you can see, does not align with the opening above. So the proposal includes amending the design of the proposed infill as well from a glazed door with a centered uh, mullion and uh, horizontal mullion simulating a one over one window to a solid metal panel door. Uh, please note they are not proposing to legalize the, the solid metal door as, as seen in some of these photos. So I'm gonna, gonna send us back here and then hand it over to Ward Dennis.
Okay, Ward, you now have control of the presentation. Yeah. Please state your name for the record, maybe begin. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Ward Dennis with Higgins Quays Barth and Partners. Uh, I am joined by Eugene Flotteron of Setra Ruddy and Justin Gumberich of Thornton Tomasetti, the structural engineer for the project. Um, <clears throat> as Abby mentioned, uh, these two buildings are uh, designated landmarks. They're part of a five building complex that has recently been renovated. Uh, the photo here, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, is the before photo. Is that going? There we go. Uh, and this is a view of the completed project with the Scrimser Pavilion to the right, uh, the plant pavilion at the center, and then beyond on 113th Street is Minturn Pavilion, which was part of the uh, residential conversion, uh, but not part of the landmark site. And this whole five building uh, complex was renovated, uh, converted to residential, uh, also using historic preservation tax credits. Uh, the project is complete and I have a couple uh, brief photos just to show you the completed work. It turned out amazingly. Uh, we're all, I think, really proud of how this project turned out and what we were able to do with the five buildings. Uh, the fifth building is at the top right there. It's an ambulance stable in the center of the complex. Uh, on the top left, as part of this project, we restored the 113th Street entry. Um, and then uh, the subject of today's application is amending the C of A uh, for this as-built condition at this doorway here, which Abby mentioned to you. This is a view from across uh, Morningside Drive. This is the Scrimser connector, which was constructed in 1929 when the Scrimser Pavilion was constructed. The plant pavilion was constructed in 1906. Uh, so we have about a 23 year gap between the uh, two uh, complexes of the building and the Scrimser Pavilion. You can see this uh, entryway here. That's the real focal point uh, of this side of the building and serves as uh, really the primary entrance for the whole complex. Um, and then again, the, the area that we're looking at is tucked over in the corner here. Uh, this is another view at the connector showing uh, the main entrance, uh, the main entrance here as well. You can see uh, the door that has been cut in here, uh, which serves, this serves as an ADA entrance. You can see that there's uh, two sets of steps coming up into the main lobby, which sits at about this height. Uh, so behind this door and behind this window, there is an interior lift, a one-story elevator, in essence. Uh, and this door provides access at grade to that lift uh, to go up to the lobby level. Um, I would note, too, that this existing historic window to the right here is also not quite centered under the door. So... There, is, there are some examples of asymmetry. And of course, the, the main focal point of this elevation is really that uh, wonderful uh, wrought iron and glass uh, canopy. Uh, so on the left is a before photo uh, prior to the start of work. This is the area where uh, the ADA entrance was approved. It was approved directly under this window. Uh, this is an older version of the as-built condition. I will show you an update that shows the, the finished masonry work. Uh, but as you can see, it is offset to the right. Uh, the reason for this is something that came up uh, in the field. Uh, uh, and the reason for it is really uh, centered on the structure of the building and really has to do with the fact that these are two buildings here, the plant building from 1906 and the Scrimser building uh, from 1929 that meet right at this corner. Uh, so again, a further away view from Morningside Drive, you can see that again, the focal point here is the main entrance. This is, uh, this is a smaller side entrance. Uh, and then looking directly on, you can see that the door is not centered underneath the window um, as built. Uh, and then these are uh, recent photos showing the finished condition at the jam returns, which are granite. Uh, 
and then the door, as Abby mentioned, this door we propose to replace with a uh, raised panel door with styles, uh, which matches the approved door, except for the fact that it's all metal instead of metal and glass. Uh, so uh, these this page is from the original application. Again, the approval on the right here was to construct uh, this door centered underneath this window leading into this ADA lift on the interior. Um, and then this photo, or sorry, this page, this drawing starts to explain the structural issues that we uh, that came up and were not known at the time of the approval, but were uh, discovered during construction. Essentially, these columns, which are part of the 1929 Scrimser Pavilion, come down onto a foundation here at the base of the building. And in order to create an at-grade entry, we need to cut through this foundation. And you can see that this southernmost column uh, of the Scrimser building sits, uh, only has a foundation to the north of it. There's no uh, foundation, there's no meat to the south of it. Uh, and that really was the essence of the issue that caused the relocation of the opening. Uh, so as designed, there was about an 18 to 20 inch uh, space from uh, the, the base of this column to the cut. And the structural engineer, once uh, he was made aware of the existence of the foundation at this height, uh, determined that this column really needed more, needed to sit on more foundation and it needed a minimum of four feet of foundation uh, to the north of it because it did not have any foundation uh, substantially to the south of it. Uh, as a result, the contractors uh, relocated the entry to accommodate that four feet. Um, uh, one of the first questions I had was, well, why can't, why does this column not need that same amount of space? And it really is because this column has all of the real estate to the north of it. Uh, so that allows it to support uh, the structural engineer's concern was that leaving only this small amount of space here would, re would compromise the structural integrity of the column above. Um, and again, this is a, a function partially of the fact that these are, this is, this is the location where the two buildings meet. So underneath here is the plant foundation, underneath here is the scrimser foundation. Uh, so this shows the same thing in elevation, the approved uh, at one foot uh, seven and five eighths, uh, and then the as built where there's a four foot space. Um, the original door was approved at four feet, two inches. The as built door is actually slightly narrower, which we think is appropriate given that it's there's no longer that alignment between the two. Um, and again, the uh, it, this is uh, the as built with the proposed door uh, with the raised panel. Uh, again, showing how it comes in to the lift here. Uh, the door is set deeply back within the opening. This is the exterior face of the building here, uh, and it is proposed as a raised panel door. Uh, which was as approved originally, although the original approval included glass panels here and we're now proposing metal, uh, but really because what you look into on this uh, door is you're really looking into an elevator shaft. Uh, so this is the original uh, existing condition pre-work. This is the area that we're looking at. Uh, this is the approved condition. Uh, and then this is the approved condition on the left with the as-built condition on the right, shifting that door about two feet to the north to accommodate the structural conditions at the foundation. Uh, and I will end here. I think this is, uh, uh, this drawing uh, replicates some of the earlier explanations so we can hopefully use it if there are any questions. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions, commissioners? All right, not seeing any questions. Um, I think it, the structural issues were pretty well explained and 
the adjustments made um, also well explained. So let, let's go ahead and unmute all of you. So I move to our discussion. Um, so as has been presented, uh, this was a new opening that we approved um, to be sent, uh, aligned with the window opening. And because of the structural condition on the interior, it was shifted two feet over. Um, and, uh, and you can see the sort of limitations within that section. It's in a, a recessed area of the building um, in, in a actually quite larger context here. So uh, let's have that discussion. Uh, Commissioner Chen, would you like to start this one? Yeah, I have no problem with this. Uh, it's in the general scope of what we originally approved, and I think this is fine. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Bland? Uh, I would agree. Commissioner Jefferson? Unfortunate, but I, I have to agree. Thank you. Commissioner Gustafson? Yeah, I, I, I agree as well. Oh, All right, Commissioner Shamir Barron? I do too, though I think that there might have been something strange that they could have tried, which is, uh, and maybe this is impossible, but imagine in plan, you know, that dimension of the, of the light blue, uh, that the threshold itself is so thick. You might've been able to kind of chamfer both sides and, and, and uh, allow for it to look like it's um, in, in line with the front facade, but actually, have it be a, di a slightly di a diagonal kind of entrance. I know that, that sounds crazy, but it, there may have been ways to deal with that thickness and cut into it differently. But um, I also think that they've tried their best here and this is an extraordinary renovation project. So um, I can accept it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner uh, Chapin? Uh, yes. Uh you know, this is a better reason than many that we see, obviously, for uh, proving a, a change in design. Uh, I guess the only issue is to say, uh, obviously, we should be notified as soon as possible to make site conditions change. Yes, absolutely. Commissioner Goldblum? I think it's appropriate. Okay, all right, so I think, you know, we, as much as we would like something to be centered and aligned, it seems that given the structural conditions here and the setback location and the secondary nature of this door in the context of this incredible complex that it doesn't seem to detract. So um, Commissioner Chen, would you be able to read a motion? Uh, uh, no problem. Uh, in the matter of LPC 22-12250, for one West 113th Street, AKA 30-34 Morningside Drive, plant and scrimser pavilions for private patients, single hospital and individual landmark. The application is to amend certificate appropriateness for the modification of a masonry opening. I recommend approval, finding that the shifting in placement of the new opening at the Eastern Connector remove only a limited amount of plain masonry and maintain both the size and shape of the approved opening and the high solid to void ratio of the connector space, that the opening was shifted in placement of the minimum amount necessary to maintain the structural integrity of the building at this location, which is at the junction of the connector and the earlier plant pavilion to the south without significantly, uh, significant underpinning and other structural interventions that the opening featuring plane instead of rusticated returns is set back significantly from public thoroughfares, thereby helping the opening's asymmetrical alignment with the window above uh, to not call undue attention to itself that the simple paneled metal door will be finished to match the infill throughout the connector and will be a discrete presence at the facade and that the revised scope of work is in keeping with the intent of the original approval. Thank you. Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? A second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. 
He's Ely? gone. Yeah, okay. he emailed Commissioner, you. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. With eight in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. That's approved. Thank you. And we'll move to the next public Thank meeting you. item. Thank you. All right. The next uh, two items will be read into the record together. Um, the first one is item number three, um, an application for a certificate of appropriateness, docket number 21-10627, 251 to 253 Fifth Avenue in the Madison Square North Historic District, Borough of Manhattan, Block 858, Lot 1. Um, this is a certificate of appropriateness for a Queen Anne style French flats building with ground floor stores designed by George B. Post and built in 1872 to 74, and a store and office building designed by Charles, Charles C. Thane and built in 1920. The application is to restore missing architectural features, modify storefronts, install a marquee, install a skylight at number 253, and to demolish number 251 and construct a new building on the site connected to number 253. And the other application is number four, docket number 22-02343. This is for 251 Fifth Avenue in the Madison Square North Historic District, Borough of Manhattan, Block 858, Lot 1. And it's for a modification of use in bulk. And this is a Queen Anne style French flats building with ground floor stores designed by George B. Post and built in 1872 to 74. And the application is to request that the Landmarks Preservation Commission issue a report to the City Planning Commission relating to an application for a modification of bulk pursuant to section 74711 of the zoning resolution. This was um, last heard at the public meeting of May 24th, 2022, at which time no action was taken. Okay, so I know that the applicant, the staff may introduce it, but the applicants are going to want to speak. So let's go ahead and open the proceedings so that they can do that seamlessly. And um, all right, Commissioner Gustafson, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? So moved. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Great, so the applicants may go ahead and, and speak seamlessly. And I just, in the interest of time, wanna just remind the commission that I think that the approach to the restoration work was uh, celebrated and embraced by all commissioners present and that sort of the, the period and the combination of elements being restored together were all supported. And as was the, the uh, new building next to it, in sort of in concept, um, but the commission did feel that the sidewall in particular was needed to be simplified that um, both in terms of its both form for some and for others, the fenestration pattern and the grid pattern and the complexity of the side facade was not typical of side facades and asked that the applicants simplify uh, much simplify that design to read as more secondary and to call less attention to the um, projecting portion of that facade. So just to set that up, um, because we do have another item to get to, um, I'll now turn it over to the staff or the applicants, yeah. Um, Michelle Cran, preservation staff. Um, I think that Chair Carroll made an excellent uh, summary of the points that I had that um, that were brought up at the public meeting. Um, I just wanted to quickly, though, remind the commissioners, um, as you did, Chair Carroll, that commissioners were in support of the restoration work and that that um, included mit restoring missing elements above the second floor, including the mansard and turret roofs. Um, and also repairing and modifying the storefronts at the first floors and installing a canopy. Um, and I think with that, we can just turn it over to the applicants. To Thank you, Michelle. I didn't mean to jump in, but I do That's want the applicants <laughs> to be focused in their response today. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, my name is Caterina Royetti. Together with Robert Prabasha and Winston Wolf, we represent here the studio, the architects for the proposal. Also present are Fred Becker, Owners Council, and Isaac Abelshalon, whose family is owned 251 and 253 Fifth Avenue for decades. 
We would like to thank the staff for working with us and for today's introduction, and particularly the commissioners for the careful review and insightful comments, which we believe helped us to further define our design. Um, the site, the site is located on the edges of Madison Square North Historic District on a prominent corner in a very dense area. The two buildings, 251 and 253, have direct sight lines to the Empire State Building and the Flat Iron. Conversely, after reconstruction, the 251 Fifth Avenue turret will be visible from both. Uh, the Madison Square Park North District is a neighborhood of exceptions marked by deviations to the grid as well as by architectural sections. Diversified typology in a vast collection of styles, materials, and scales. Excerpts from the condition report. Um, this is just to kind of remind everybody um, kind of about uh, the facts about the two buildings. 251 Fifth Avenue was built in 1872, designed in Queen Anne style by George B. Post one of the earliest surviving apartment buildings intended to attract most of the single men. 251 Fifth Avenue maintains enough of the original fabric to make the restoration both possible and necessary. 253 Fifth Avenue, the repurposing of 253 Fifth Avenue from townhouse to commercial use gradually stripped the building of any historic fabric so much that it is described as no style in the condition report. The, the deterioration was later accelerated by conjoining the two structures into a hybrid commercial lost complex. Current views of the site. The close-up views illustrate the unique prominence and visibility of the corner site. The unpredictable streetscape surrounding the site is a collection of diversified typologies, styles, and scale. The very tall 261 and 243 Fifth Avenue dominate the east side of Fifth Avenue and 20th Street. The history of 251 and 253 reflects the neighborhood loss of heritage that followed the repurposing of most buildings in the district. The recent influx of the residential conversion and new development has and continues to bring new vibrancy to the district. The proposed restoration in new building will greatly contribute to the transformation. Um, Fifth Avenue evolution timeline. The proposal will bring back the historical significance of 251 Fifth Avenue by completely restoring it and replicating the elements that have been removed. Katerina, I hate to interrupt you, but I think we all thought we the restoration was great. Yeah, yes. so, um, so um, focus on the design changes. Just we can go directly to the design changes, absolutely. Uh, you can just scroll Winston, uh, faster. These are studies of the neighborhood, references, of course. Um, we saw them the last time, please go further. Cantilevers that have been approved in the historic district. And now um, about the proposed design, uh, I'll pass it on to okay. Paul. Uh, this view looking north shows 251 Fifth Avenue as seen against the backdrop of 253 Fifth Avenue. The regeneration of the historic building is also a statement of urban regeneration. Its restoration will restore and repair the layers of history and bring a renewed significance to the site, the block, and the district. 253 Fifth Avenue proposal confronts the challenge of producing thoughtful contemporary architecture. The new building embraces the district's eclectic characteristics, respectfully standing out while supporting the significance of the historic landmark. The new building is at once a suitable backdrop to the historic building and a proud presence along the Fifth Avenue street wall. Strategic massing revisions. The design of 253 Fifth Avenue is informed by the idea that the air parcel above the historic building contains DNA that shapes the design of the new building, tying 253 and 251 Fifth Avenue in an integrated whole. 
253 Fifth Avenue sculpts itself into a form that is at once innovative and reminiscent of the mansard roofs and step setbacks found in the area. The comparison diagrams between the massing as originally proposed and the current design illustrates the progressive refinements, the simplification reinforcing the original gesture. On the left, the massing is simplified by straightening the 28th Street facade. On the right, the massing is also simplified. The plane of the 251 Fifth Avenue mansard roof and the viewing angles from across the street are extended to move the bulk away from the front facade and turret. Upper floor chambers. Two muscular massive structures that flank the site, 261 and 249 Fifth Avenue, not shown in the diagrams, do inform the evolution of the massing. Both structures do not follow the classical base shaft top configuration. Instead, at the top, the shaft dissolves into a series of dormers. On the left, the street wall is raised by one floor. On the right, the plane of the 251 Fifth Avenue mansard roof is extended through the building in one gesture. Cornice and window wall changes. On the left is a diagram showing the introduction of a stylized terracotta cornice instead of a projecting mantle, metal cornice. On the right, the images shows the revisions to the fenestrations on 28th Street. The metal slab covers have been eliminated the window wall depth have been reduced and the grouping of the windows have been configured to recall the tripartite windows seen on the side walls in the district. The treatment of both facades is at once repetitive and varied to produce a facade evocative of the historic detailing while maintaining a contemporary timeless expression. Summary of changes, including building massing and architectural details. The left image is the original proposal at the right image is the summary of changes to the proposed building highlighted in color. Proposed design revisions, views looking north. On the left is the view of from Fifth Avenue as presented at the May 24th meeting. On the right is the current proposal. The changes previously described pertain and include the simplification of the building massing and architectural details of the 28th Street facade. Proposed design, 5th Avenue and 28th Street elevations. Although the 5th Avenue and 28th Street facades share the same materials in similar language while responding to their unique conditions. The 5th Avenue facade is an, is an alignment with the street wall of the adjacent buildings characterized at the lower floors by large commercial windows placed within mortise set terracotta tiles. The upper floors change into smaller windows surrounded by stylized shaped terracotta spandrels with terracotta pilasters. The 28th Street elevation shows the relationship between the geometry of the historic building below and the upper building. The grid of the 28th Street facade has been changed to reflect the large tripartite window assembly of 261 Fifth Avenue in the background. 28th Street facade. The diagram highlights the relationship between the geometries of the lower and the upper buildings. Following the spirit of Queen Anne building below, the window grid is symmetrical, but not exactly regular, but not regular, but with exceptions. The shaded areas of the diagram also illustrate the portion of the solid masonry versus glass surfaces. Fifth Avenue and 28th Street panorama. The panoramas illustrate the fact that the height of the proposed development as a whole fits within, fits within with the varied heights of the buildings in the district, which vary from three to 28 floors. Fifth Avenue and 28th Street panoramas close up. The panoramas illustrate a closer view of the building within their context. Window wall proposed design. A clear hierarchy is established between the Fifth Avenue and the 28th Street facade. The Fifth Avenue facade is clad with, with shaped glazed decorative spandrels and flat terracotta pilaster panels. As shown in the close-up view of the facade, the extruded spandrels recalls the abstract patterns found on masonry buildings in the district. The 28th Street facade is similar, but clad with simpler matte and glazed flat terracotta tiles. Typical 28th Street facade window assembly details. The recess of the 28th Street window wall 
have been reduced to be in scale with the depth of the window recesses of the side wall of 261 Fifth Avenue building. Proposed cornice design. <clears throat> A glazed terracotta fluted cornice at once utilitarian and decorative doubles as a parapet. The minimal but intentional design completes the building in a way similar to how the two large historic buildings nearby 249 and 261 terminate against the sky. North facade view. The facade turns the corner to capture the Empire State Building views. The vertical line of windows recalls the light well seen on the side walls of buildings in the district. The secondary facade is clad in sand colored bricks, typical for the district. North facade close up view. As described in the previous image, the north facade is shown here more in detail. View looking north, the urbanistic significance of the turret is returned to the building and to the district. View looking east. This view of the proposed development from across Fifth Avenue shows the extension of the 28th Street facade moving away from Fifth Avenue. It appears to fade into the background context of the tall buildings that surround the development site. View of the mansard roof against the new building. The, the muted palette of the new building harmonizes with the surrounding buildings and provides a backdrop to the vibrantly colored historic building. 251 and 253 Fifth Avenue work as partners. They respectively represent the old and the new, each enhancing the other. They sim simultaneously, they are simultaneously distinct and part of a whole. View of the turret against the new building. The mansard roof on the left side of 251 Fifth Avenue turret is at once the separation and the connection between and with the abutting building. This intentional action is respected and highlighted in the proposal by extending the mansard plane along the new building, shifting the weight of the volume towards the back, freeing the turret. View looking north with the Empire State Building. This view reconstructs the 1905 historic photograph that guided the restoration. The urbanistic significance of the turret is returned to the building and to the district. Even among the tallest surrounding buildings, the architectural significance of the landmark building is enhanced by the new building backdrop. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, and thanks for, I know you had a longer presentation in mind. And so I do appreciate your condensing it and focusing on the changes. Um, commissioners, do we have any questions for the applicant? Uh, uh, no, but Chair Carroll, I was yes. not here for the original presentation. So I, I have to recuse myself. Uh, well, you don't have to recuse yourself, but maybe we do need to give you a little more background information. So. Um, well, no, I, I'm, I'm fine. I think I understand. Okay. So th this is, yeah. there are two applications before us. One is for a 74 uh, of support of a request for uh, uh, bulk waivers for a, a pursuant to section 74, 711 of the zoning resolution. And uh, when we evaluate those, we look to see whether there is a preservation purpose. And so the restoration plan would be part of that in addition to an ongoing cyclical maintenance plan um, that goes on into the future. And, uh, and the second part of it is that we would look to see whether those bulk waivers result in a harmonious relationship. And then the other application is for the certificate of appropriateness for the design of the new building adjacent on the adjacent lot. Um, which is the bulking bulk, uh, the building for which they are seeking the bulk waivers. And so there are two applications, two components, one largely restoration and the other a design review. And we um, looked at this last time and um, felt comfortable with the general height and massing of the building, um, but felt that the cantilever, the sort of, uh, bulbous kind of uh, massing on the side and the expression of the fenestration pattern and the wall details were too busy and called too much attention to that side wall and asked that the applicants 
um, look to simplify that, both the form of it, even if that meant making the building taller and the detailing of it. So that's where we are. So what maybe what we'll do is we can have others um, comment and you can sort of listen to the comments and see how you feel about it. But if you in condition yeah. photos or any other information now to help you understand the site, we're happy to do that. No, um, I'm fine, thank you. Okay, all right. Okay, so we're gonna um, start our conversation and um, Commissioner Goldblum, I think you led this off last time and if you wouldn't mind leading it again, I think you were yeah. quite comfortable with the concept of this, even as a 74, 711, but did specifically comment on the busy nature of the side facade. Right, I, I, I do feel to, as well today as I did before that this project in, in all my time on the commission is probably the most appropriate use of the 74711 regulation that I know of, where the zoning is modified to create a more contextually appropriate building and to conform to the uh, uh, individual landmark as well. I think it's, it's really uh, excellent textbook. I think that the simplification of the side facade is successful. Um, and I think it's appropriate as is, although I would make a suggestion to the applicant to consider in concert with staff, the top cornice element is a little bit neither here nor there. The two buildings that are, the two big buildings next to this building are kind of exemplars, of two ways to handle that top in a way that is consistent with the style being used here. The first way of the building to the south has an articulated horizontal band that connects the vertical piers and has a, a very modest but shadow inducing detail at the top to create a kind of modernish version of modernish version of a cornice. The second way to look at it is to the building to the north, uh, the taller building to the north, which is a very common art deco way to handle the top of the building where the vertical piers kind of pass by the top spandrel and create a more crenellated uh, uh, top profile against the sky. I think that either of those approaches would enhance both the building's appearance and its connection to its site. So I would suggest that, that you explore that if, you, if you're interested uh, with the staff. However, I think it's appropriate as, as, as presented. Okay, great, thank you. Commissioner Chen. Yeah, I, I agree with Commissioner Goldblum, the, uh, especially about the, uh, the uh, termination on the top, uh, as well as the detail working with staff. Uh, and I have no problem with the application. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I'm gonna skip you, Commissioner Jefferson, just to give others who were here a chance to speak. Uh, Commissioner Gustafson. Yeah, I think the thing that, uh, um, disturbed me most was how busy the facade, the, uh, facade, the side facade was of the building. And I think they, they dealt with that in a subtle way. And I, th I think it's, it's improved it dramatically. So I'm, I'm okay with it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I, I think I was pretty positive about it previously. And I think um, it's been further refined. I agree with Commissioner Goldblum. There's a little bit of, um, a sort of extra fussiness in the top and the terracotta, but I think otherwise they really have done a good job. And um, there is a kind of an interesting, um, both overt and subtle relationship between the buildings. And I think it, it's it's really um, well done. And I have, and I think that the that the work they're doing, the restor restorative work they're doing is are actually really well conceived. So I think this is appropriate. Oh, Sarah's frozen. Thank you. I know. Late in the day. I... <laughs> All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Chapin. 
Uh, I think the restoration work is great. Um, unfortunately, I still feel that this angled building uh, calls a lot of attention to itself. That's and that's part of the point, obviously. But I'm not so comfortable with the the uh, its relationship, and um, so I don't think I can approve this. And I don't think they're going to want to change it. But hopefully, I think there are probably enough votes for it without me. So mm -hmm. two, three, four. I don't know that there are actually. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Did I, um, so Commissioner Jefferson, that's back to you. Um, I think it meets the criteria for the bulk assessment, I guess. And um, I think as architecture, it does work. I think the cornice is an issue for me. I'd agree with my fellow commissioners, but on a whole, it, it holds together. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and I, I also agree. I think that um, in terms of the sort of overall height and massing of the building, it is um, consistent with the variety of building types that we went through in the, in the first presentation, as well as other presentations for this historic district, um, for new buildings in this historic district. And this sort of tall slab form is certainly a form that is in the district. And the cantilever, I think, is much improved in both in terms of how it's been carved back and simplified, um, and also uh, how the design has been simplified so it doesn't call attention to it. And I think the, the point of its lowest point is out of uh, the line of sight from most angles. And so I think you wouldn't necessarily even perceive that that is uh, projecting out. And I also agree that the cornice could be further refined working in consultation with the staff and also support the um, restoration work, which I think will be fabulous for this particular corner um, and, and find that the adjustments uh, to the massing of this building support the, and have a harmonious relationship with the historic building. So I think we do have six to go ahead and approve this uh, and with the condition that they continue to work with the staff on refining the termination of the building. So Mike, uh, Commissioner Goldblum, would you go ahead and make that motion? Sure. All right. Uh, regarding, right, it's it's a two for one. Two, yeah. Okay. You got scared um, on your earlier one. <laughs> yeah, well, give it and take it. Um, all right, regarding 251 to 253 Fifth Avenue, Madison Square, North Historic District, the application is to restore missing architectural features, modify storefronts, Install a marquee, install a skylight at number 253, demolish 251, construct a new building on the site, connect it to 253. Um, I note that the style scale, materials, and details of 251 Fifth Avenue contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the historic district. And that 253 Fifth Avenue was not one of the buildings for which the historic district was, was designated. I also note that the Madison Square North Historic District contains a rich and varied collection of brownstone residences, large apartment buildings, hotels, and high-rise office and loft structures built between the 1870s and 1930s, often existing within the same streetscapes, which reflect the area's successive phases of development and changes over time. Uh, with regard to the new building, I recommend approval with modifications, finding that the 253 Avenue is not one of the buildings for which the historic district was designated, therefore its demolition will not diminish the special architectural and historic character of the district, that the plane of the front facade of the proposed new building will align with the facades of adjacent properties, therefore reinforcing the street wall, a consistent feature of this historic district, that this historic district features a combination of low and mid-rise buildings, tall buildings on large lots, and taller, thinner buildings on small lots, formerly occupied by residential buildings. Therefore, the height and massing of the proposed building will recall the variations in height and massing of the historic buildings in this district. That the proportions of this tall and narrow front facade featuring large windows flanked by masonry piers and spandrels are typical of many commercial buildings in the historic district, that the floor and ceiling heights will approximate the scale of neighboring property of 251 Fifth Avenue, helping to maintain a harmonious relationship with the neighboring building, 
that the large double height display windows, single, height, single light doors at the first floor mezzanine level will be compatible with the proportions and size of the storefront in Villa 251 Fifth Avenue and will be in keeping with other storefronts and building entrances in the streetscape and historic district that profiled in flat buff colored terracotta paneling, cladding, and beige finished metal inset windows will create depth and articulation that are evocative of the depth and articulation found on historic terracotta and clad, brick clad buildings within this historic district. Um, that the cantilever, I'm sorry, that the proposed portions of the new building that cantilever over the portions of the historic building will not damage the building and will be set back from the primary facade, thereby helping it to maintain, to remain subservient to the historic building. The cantilever will project only over a small portion of the historic building and will be set back from the Fifth Avenue facade and will not be immediately perceptible when viewed from the south. But the smooth terracotta cladding panels and regularized fenestration at the south facade will be in keeping with the simplified vocabulary of designed secondary facades found within the historic district and will provide a neutral backdrop for the historic building. That the materiality of secondary facades and rooftop accretions featuring light colored brick and stucco cladding, and brown finished metal windows will be in keeping with the materials and finishes found at secondary facades and rooftop accretions at buildings throughout the historic district and of the contemporary vocabulary of the new building will create a harmonious juxtaposition with the adjacent historic building and surrounding streetscape. However, I recommend that the applicant work with staff uh, to modify the detailing at the cornice. With regard to the historic building, I recommend approval. Finding that the building has undergone numerous alterations over time and most of the exterior work will restore or closely recall the 1905 conditions, enhancing the appearance of the historic building. That significant portions of the party walls between the historic building and new building will be retained at the first floor and mezzanine level, helping to maintain individual character of the historic building. That the alterations to the storefronts will support the preservation and reuse of the ground floor of the building. That only a limited amount of historic cast iron will be altered to facilitate raising the ceiling heights of the ground floor, floor storefronts. That the modified ground floor cast iron will match the existing cast iron in terms of materials and details. That the projecting oriel at the easternmost storefront bay on the south facade is not an original storefront element, therefore its removal will not result in the elimination of historic, significant historic fabric from the 1905 period restoration. But the very low, minimally designed storefront bulkheads will help to recall the historic, the low-grade storefront entrances. But the marquee will be simply designed, well-scaled through the engines and finished to match the surrounding storefront cast iron. That the skylight will be, is required by the building code for light and air and will only be seen at a distance from oblique angle to limited locations on Fifth Avenue. And that the work will enhance the special architectural and historic character of the Madison Square North Historic District. All right, thank you. All right, and Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Nay. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner, Dev, uh, Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Six in favor and one opposed, the motion passes. Okay. Regarding Thank you. 251 Fifth Avenue, Madison Square North Historic District, the application is to uh, relate in relating to an applic uh, application for modification of bulk pursuant to section 74711 of the zoning resolution. I note that the style, scale, materials, and details of 251 Fifth Avenue contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Madison Square North Historic District, and I recommend approval. Finding that the restorative work approved pursuant to application LPC 21 10627, including removal of paint, replacement of windows, repair of masonry and metalwork, the creation of tower, and other missing architectural features will help to return the building closer to its historic appearance and will aid in the long-term preservation of the building. That the restorative work will reinforce the architectural and historic character of the building in the historic district, that the restorative work will bring the building up to a sound first-class condition and aid in its long-term preservation, that the bulk waiver being sought relates harmoniously to the landmark and buildings in the historic district that the implementation of a cyclical maintenance plan will ensure 
the continued maintenance of the building in a sound first class condition that the owners of the designated building have committed themselves to establishing a perpetual cyclical maintenance plan that will be legally enforceable by the Landmarks Preservation Commission under the provisions of a restrictive declaration, which will bind all heirs, successors, assigns, and subsequent owners of the building, and which will be recorded at the New York County Registrar's Office. Right, and uh, Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. All right, and Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. I think I have to vote no on yep. this because I voted right. no on that. Is that correct, right. Mark? Yep. Commissioner yep. Uh, Chen. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. With uh, six in favor and one opposed, the motion passes. All right. So those are approved. Thank you. And we'll move to the next and final item. The next item, commissioners, is um, item or item number five. Uh, docket number 22-04647, 105 to 107 Bank Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District, Borough of Manhattan, Block 635, Lots 33 and 34. This is an application for a certificate of appropriateness, a Greek revival style row house built in 1846 and a Greek revival style row house built in 1846 and later altered. The application is to combine the buildings, construct rooftop and rear yard additions, alter facades, areaways and the party wall and excavate the cellars and rear yards. And this was last heard at the public hearing of June 7th, 2022, at which time no action was taken. Okay, and just to, again, to sort of move things along seamlessly, let's go ahead and open the proceedings. We know the applicant is going to want to uh, talk about their revisions. So Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? Oops, can you hear me? I don't think she's there. Oh. Can you hear me? No, no, Sarah, I think that Diana is, uh, is not in her, She's walked away from it. Oh, she's so, walked away. I thought it yeah, was yeah, me yeah. again that I, I was frozen for you. Okay, sorry. Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so when the time comes, the applicants may seamlessly start speaking. Okay, aye. Irene. Irene, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen and then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Um, and the project team uh, may begin. Please state your name for the record before you do so. Uh, thank you, commissioners. I'm Bill Higgins of Higgins and Quaysbarth. Um, and we very much appreciate your allowing us to uh, come to you this late uh, uh, summer afternoon uh, to present to you the revisions that we have made to our proposal in response to your comments and suggestions at the public hearing of June 7th. Um, I'm here with Gary Brewer of Robert A.M. Stern, um, and we will uh, endeavor to go through our changes in as focused and, uh, and efficient a way as possible. Um, you had three major uh, sets of comments and suggestions for us, um, and we have made um, what we think are substantial changes to the design and substantial, in fact, improvements to the design in response to all three of those. Um, Gary will go over them in detail, um, but I would just like to briefly characterize them. Uh, first is uh, adjusting the relationship between the parapet um, and the cornice, which we have proposed to replace the missing uh, cornice on the Bank Street side of the building. We have adjusted the parapet height so that the relationship between the cornice and the parapet is more in keeping with historical norms. Um, second, you suggested that we find ways to change uh, design and dimensions um, in order to reduce the prominence and the visibility of the proposed one-story rooftop addition at both uh, the front and the rear. Um, and it, we have responded to this in a number uh, of ways. We have reduced the footprint of the proposed addition by over 34% from 1,037 to 684 square feet. 
Um, we have uh, kept its roof structure at the minimum as calculated by the structural engineers. Um, and we have reduced the ceiling height to eight and a half feet, uh, which is the same as the historic ceiling height uh, on the top floors uh, of, of the two Greek revival buildings. Um, uh, we have uh, also um, uh, uh, in, in, in the course of this reduction of the footprint, um, we have substantially uh, increased setbacks at both front and rear. Um, and this is something that you'll see clearly um, as Gary uh, presents uh, the design. Um, and so finally, you suggested that we retain the top floor rear wall of 105 Bank Street, um, if in fact, uh, on further examination, it did prove to be original or historic. Uh, we looked carefully at that. That, um, removed uh, interior plaster, um, removed exterior stucco, um, and, and we have found that, in fact, um, the, uh, the rear wall is, is consistent with structure uh, of 1846, or if later, very, very shortly thereafter. Um, so it is the historic um, rear wall at the top floor, um, and we are proposing, as you will see, uh, to maintain it and its fabric in its existing position. Um, so uh, with that summary, and again, with thanks, um, I will ask Gary Brewer to go over uh, our design changes in detail. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Bill. And this is Gary Brewer from Robert Stern Architects. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> so the format of these drawings um, are pretty much on the left is the existing conditions. In the center drawing is what was presented at the last LPC hearing. And on the right is the proposed change that we're showing today. So on the right um, at 105, the design uh, that was presented uh, at the last hearing is pretty much the same with the third floor windows being lowered, uh, the stucco being removed, the brick being exposed, the caps being added, and the cornice being added in the same location. But what has changed is that the brick parapet that's existing, we are uh, proposing lowering it by five inches. Next, please. So here you can see at the top, the existing um, of 105. In the middle is what was proposed at the last hearing with 11 inches projecting above the new um, cornice. And then the proposed design is the new cornice with uh, reducing the projection above it at six inches so that it is not visible uh, from the pedestrian level at the street looking straight at it. Next, please. Uh, these are the alley um, uh, elevations on the left is the previous design. So you can see barely that, the, uh, that this is 11 inches and that the setback um, where we jog the wall so that it aligns with what's at the garden facade is uh, sort of midway. The proposed design reduces the parapet uh, to six inches but moves the setback so that it aligns with where the handrail is and also allows to help in the perspectives to conceal some of the, um, the proposed um, uh, penthouse addition uh, beyond. Next, please. So here you can see it at a larger scale. This is the lowered uh, uh, parapet at Bank Street. And then this is the new location of the jog uh, to bring you back to the existing third floor, which is um, being saved in this proposal. Next, please. So for the penthouse revisions, next. Uh, Bill, do you wanna talk to this slide? Yeah, uh, ju just very briefly, um, some, some examples of um, other uh, rooftop additions that have been approved uh, in recent years uh, in the district, and I won't go over them in detail, um, but just, just to mention that um, these are one-story uh, additions um, in a variety of, uh, of sort of stylistic uh, languages and a variety of materials. 
um, and that the changes that we are proposing, we feel um, go, go further um, in the direction of bringing the design and the dimensions <coughs> and the historical references uh, of, of our proposed one story addition uh, further into line with the kinds of proposals the commissioners have been approving recently. Thanks. Great. Next, please. So on the left is the existing conditions and on the right is the proposed um, design. And um, the changes that were made at 105 and 107's penthouse, uh, we have reduced um, an additional five inches in height from the earlier design so that both 105 and 107 are now seven inches lower in height than the adjacent townhouse addition at 109, which you can see right here. And we in fact look closely at 109's proposed addition, penthouse addition, which is being built because it is the first penthouse that is in the row of these four penthouses, which was also approved uh, by LPC. Next, please. So here you can see uh, on the left, the existing, in the middle, what, what was proposed, and on the right, um, the proposed changes in addition to lowering the height of the proposed penthouse at 105 and 107. At the last commission hearing, there was discussion about uh, would the material of the proposed penthouses be copper or zinc? And so we have taken uh, the suggestion to um, combine um, two different colors of metal so that it breaks down the scale of and makes each of the penthouse additions, one above 105 and one above 107, um, as being individual with the gray metal in between it being the sort of separator between the two. So here you can see the changes in the material um, and hopefully that it breaks down the scale of uh, what was proposed at the last hearing, uh, which is um, was meant to be all clad in copper. Next, please. Uh, we have also um, reduced the eave detail. Um, which was in the previous presentation, 10 inches, and we've reduced it down to eight inches. And it's recalling the, uh, actually the cornices and the heads over townhouses are often projecting so that they project, protect the windows from water above. And so that is um, part of the proposed design and the change that we have made to simplify it. Next, please. Uh, the materials um, for the copper, we are proposing a pre-patinated copper. Uh, for the gray metal, um, since zinc and copper are not compatible metals, we are proposing that the metal have a zinc-like look, which would be gray, and we would work um, ideally with the uh, at a staff level to get exactly the right colors of the copper and the metal since that's so important. And then for the overruns of the chimneys and the um, elevator, we would propose that those would be stucco. Um, on the bottom right is the proposed change of the, um, of the penthouse that we'll talk about shortly, but we would also use copper above 105 and the, uh, the zinc colored meadow above 107. Next, please. So the footprint of the previous design is on the left in blue, and you can see the size of it in relationship to 109's penthouse. But in particular, we were looking at 109's penthouse that faces towards Bank Street and using that as a guide to uh, push back the proposed uh, penthouses at 105 and 107. And so at 107, the revised street facade penthouse has been pushed back four foot six from its earlier design. Um, and at 105, its street facade penthouse has been pushed back from two foot 10 from its earlier design. And in comparison to 109, the new facades of 105 and 107 are approximately three feet behind the front penthouse of 107. And the change at 107's stair in our design 
is um, set back from the stair at 109 and forms an octagon, um, which we think also helps to articulate uh, 107 from 105 and make each of those penthouses individual. Next, please. So on the left, you can see the earlier design in blue and on the right, the proposed design showing how facing Bank Street, the, um, uh, the new design pushes away from the street. And in particular, you can see how much smaller the new uh, penthouse is um, in comparison to the earlier design. And the way that we like to think of it is that in a way, these are two individual penthouses that are added above 105 and 107, which are comparable in size to the 109. Next, please. Uh, Gary, I'm yes, sorry sir. to interrupt, but I think sure. it's important to mention that, it's, that, that, that we have re, uh, redesigned and repositioned the elevator bulkhead so that although it is not shorter, it could not be made shorter than the one we previously proposed, it is substantially farther back. Yeah, good um, point. Instead of being 14 inches back, it is, it is about four foot eight, I think. And, and that considerably reduces the sort of highest point of visibility in our proposal. Thank you, Bill. So uh, next, please. So in the previous presentation, we had perspective view number four, which was taken from one spot in Greenwich, which happened to crop out of the view 109 and only show 105 and 107. So we have new revised perspective view, that perspective view showing the revised design. But we have also moved up north on Greenwich Street so that we could look at the visibility of the penthouses of 105 and 107 in relationship to 109, which is also visible in this view. Next, please. So on the left is the existing uh, um, uh, or the earlier view of the previous design of 105 and 107. And on the right-hand side are the changes that have ma been made that we discussed with pushing uh, the penthouse um, uh, facade farther away from Bank Street. Next, please. And here you can see it in a, uh, in a closer view. Um, this is 105, this is 107, and peeking out right here is a bit of uh, 109. Um, by lowering the, uh, the parapet, it's exposing a little bit more of the penthouse, but the penthouse does get pushed back and it has an oct octagonal shape. And this is where we pull forward the side parapet to help to hide a bit of 105. Uh, next, please. And then this is that second view where you move farther north on Greenwich Street so that you could see on the left-hand side the existing conditions with the 109 penthouse, which is being built and was approved by LPC. And then on the right-hand side is our new proposed design with the octagon at 107, the gray metal that separates the, the copper of 105 and 107, and then the receding or pushing back of the penthouse design of the proposed design. Next, please. And then here is a comparison. On the left-hand side was the earlier design for 105 and 107, which hopefully um, is seen as looking bigger than what is being proposed in the uh, revision on 105 and 107. Both of these renderings show the visibility of the 109 penthouse from Greenwich Street. Next, please. So moving to the rear, on the left is the existing and on the right is the proposed with the biggest change of at 105, we are saving the third floor where uh, it is originally located. We are slightly proposing to lower the parapet and then um, everything else of the design uh, below that line is staying the same. But at the upper level of 105, that facade of the penthouse pushes back. And then above 107, that facade of the penthouse pushes back and is changed to um, a gray zinc-like metal. 
Next, please. So here you can see um, in the middle what the earlier design was. And on the right, the larger scale elevation of the third floor of 105 staying the same. There, be, there is a terrace that becomes that is here. This metal turns to gray and everything else is sort of staying the same. Next, please. So an axon comparison of the earlier design on the left and the proposed on the right, where the third floor of 105 stays the same. This facade pushes back and the, uh, the upper level of 105 is reduced uh, slightly. The other change is that in the previous design, although we did not show it, there would have been a requirement to have mechanical units on the ceiling. So by pushing back the wall of 107, we are using this parapet to uh, locate the mechanical units so that there is no units on the street that are visible from either bank or the garden. Uh, next, please. So the view from Bethune, the left is the earlier design and the right is the proposed design. So you can see the third floor of 105 being saved, forming a, um, a terrace. And then the lower height of the proposed penthouse with its facade pushing back. Uh, next, please. And then in conclusion, this is the, um, exist, or the earlier scheme on the left. And on the right, you can see 105's third floor being retained, um, the penthouse pushing back, and the height of it being lowered by five inches, and then this facade being pushed back so that it is less visible from, uh, from this view. Uh, next, please. Uh, just the just the very briefest of conclusions. Um, so, in, in summary, uh, on the left, um, what we are proposing to do uh, with Bank Street and also with the rear, since we're uh, preserving the the top floor wall of 105 Bank, uh, is really to make the the Greek Revival row, which has now been substantially um, uh, uh, altered in its in its legibility. Uh, by the current condition of 105, um, is to make that much more legible um, and coherent as a Greek revival row. Um, and, and on the right, um, what we are proposing um, are the kinds of rear yard additions that are very much in line with uh, the commissioner's actions and we think uh, policies regarding uh, buildings in rows. And what we are proposing uh, on the roof is a setback one story addition with an eight foot five uh, ceiling height, um, which matches the historic ceiling height on the, on the top floor, which is the lowest ceiling height uh, of the historic buildings. And, and again, we think and hope um, is within the range of, of ceiling height that is not uh, aggressive uh, or out of scale with the, uh, the historic building below. Thank you, commissioners. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have at least one question. So Commissioner Goldblum, please go ahead. Okay. Um, in this view, the revised rear rendering. So there's no corbeling at the top of the existing 105 bank parapet, but there is going to be corbeling or detailing of some kind at the top of the 107 bank. Is that, am I reading that right? That's correct. And, correct. and that's, the way, that's the way it is now. 105 <laughs> has none, 107 has a slight corbel. Second, in the front, you're showing a leader in between 105 and 107. Would there, is that supported by what was there, by what you conjecture? Would there have been another one on 105? Um, uh, my recollection is that there was a leader um, between there, yes, there there is a leader there currently. Yeah. There was an existing leader there. Yeah, yeah, and, and and we and we also thought that by retaining that leader, I mean, I think that for 105 to have the uh, the cornice higher than 107 helps with the reading of 
them being two different buildings. And we thought that retaining the leader between 105 and 107 <coughs> with the conductor box, um, that that helped in distinguishing the buildings as being two different townhouses, even though on the inside there will be combined as one. I, I don't disagree with you. I'm just asking if there may have been, is there any evidence for there having been another one on the, on the right side of 105? Uh, no. Okay. And then a question for staff. Um, this rooftop addition has, still has uh, visibility um, from various points in, in the public way. Is it your recollection that the rooftop addition at 109 had a similarly extensive view corridor or were they just luckier to be in a different place in the block? Bernadette's preservation staff, we did do a site visit. When we were out, there was scaffolding at 109, but from what we could tell, it, it, it really had to do with location. You can see 109 um, when you're closer to the corner and then as you go further away, you can no longer see 109, but you can still see 105 and 107. Please judge, these guys just didn't get lucky. Yes. Okay, thank you. And then just to follow up on that question, on this page 26, where we see on the left-hand photo with 105 and 107, and you can see behind the tree, a little piece of 109. Are we seeing the rooftop addition we approved above the cornice there? Yes. We yes. If if the question is is this the is this the rooftop addition that was approved for 109, that is uh, uh, what we have added into our rendering. Okay. So. The uh, addition at 109 Bank Street is seen from view five on Greenwich Street, but because when you move further down to view four, the buildings block that building. You actually see a little corner of it, um, but on, on Bank Street, actually looking at the buildings, you can see the one on 109, yes. and you won't see the, two, the, one, the additions on 105 and 107. Okay. Commissioner Jefferson. I, I have to say, I'm a little confused. Um, if you look at the front facade and, and why it's so visible, is it because of the octagon? Because the octagon is a different form. So therefore it, 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 it has more visibility. If it was a straight form, do you think it would be less visible? It depends, I think, where you make it straight. Well, so the, pre the, right, the previous the proposal had it straight at the farthest, most forward part of the, of the octagon shape. And, but if you were to make, bring it straight across from behind the octagon, then it would be less visible, right? Yeah. Yes, that's my point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, applicants, do you want to respond to that question? I, I just yeah, I, I think that that's a good question. Um, if you can see my pointer, this face is the same plane as the earlier design. But by carving away at the stair to make it an octagon, mm -hmm. you can see in the new design that there's air or kind of breathing space between 109 and 107, which wasn't in the previous design. So mm -hmm. we thought that that carving away helped to, you know, make the um, the penthouse addition on 107 more sympathetic and and look smaller in our opinion. Yeah, it, it, you're also right. It does do that, and it's a difficult problem you have. I, I agree because you can't get it, you can't go any lower, eight foot six minimum, and, and it's still quite visible. And if you went straight across, the octagon, which is a nice element, would be lost. So I, I, I see your predicament. Okay, other questions? Okay, and I do want to note for the record that we, we did receive 
a letter from Village Preservation and uh, from an individual that uh, stated some remaining issues with the revised proposal. Those letters were shared with you all in advance of today, and I'm just noting that um, we received them. And so if there are no other questions, I'm going to send you all requests to unmute and we'll begin our discussion. And um, so as was presented the last time, there were sort of three issues that were remaining um, that the applicants were asked to re-study. One is that one was the relationship of the cornice to the parapet and um, the applicants have lowered the parapet and uh, changed that relationship uh, so that you don't see it above the cornice. And the other was the, the overall amount and volume of additions. And so the footprint of the rooftop addition, as we've seen, has been much reduced, setting back both the front and the rear and the top floor. And the third, uh, and, it, and the rear yard addition has been lowered a floor. So in volume, both the rooftop and rear yard additions have been reduced. Um, but the third issue, which is connected to that, is that there was a concern about the removal of the top floor of 105 Bank Street and the applicants are now proposing to maintain that top floor. So the rooftop addition will be set back from the top floor of 105 Bank Street and the rear yard addition would be reduced so that it is maintained in its historic location and materials. Um, so that's where we are with the rooftop and rear yard additions and cornice. Um, so we'll begin our discussion. Um, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you like to start this one? Yes, thank you. Um, so I think it's um, the positive that they worked out and changed uh, the, the relationship of the cornices to one another. I think they read well now. Um, I also am glad that the, um, the rear yard addition top floor was reduced. Um, <coughs> And I think it really makes a huge difference uh, on our understanding of, of the, the differences between the buildings, but also um, kind of settles them back into their historic context. So I think that that's very positive. Um, I'm encouraged that they've reduced the size of the rooftop additions, but I think that one or both, uh, I, I'm not sure if, if, the, if it's the fact that both buildings have rooftop additions that's, that seems to me to continue to be overly visible um, and that perhaps if one of them was eliminated or uh, it, it might be better, but I still think that the rooftop additions are too visible um, even though they are reduced in visibility and that, that that's actually not acceptable here. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, I, I'm happy with the uh, change in the uh, parapet so that from the front, uh, things appear in a way that I think is much more suitable. Um, I think also the reduction of the penthouse visibility has, has been, is, is really good. And also the existing third floor uh, wall being revealed. Uh, so I think all of those changes are really very, very positive. Um, I, I, I guess I feel that uh, while there's a lot, there's still a lot of visibility of the penthouses, that that's in part due to the uh, location. So uh, I'm kind of sympathetic to uh, approving this as presented. I guess I'll see what uh, others feel about the visibility of the penthouses, but I think that they've made, you know, it, very, very substantial changes uh, to uh, respond to our comments. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Thank you. Uh, I agree with what's been said in terms of the front. I think that the cornice modification has been successful. I think that the retention of the third floor, 107, it was successful. Uh, but in looking at the um, uh, looking at the, at the visibility studies, I I think that you know when we when we classify something as and we work very hard to try to minimize visibility from the front. Clearly, 109 has limited visibility. I think 
simply by virtue of the location of these two sites, they seem to offer more visibility of a rooftop addition that by its dimensional relationship with its neighbor should be no more objectionable than that was. But I think that the way we look at these things has to do with the um, <clears throat> degree to which and the extent to which one sees these as kind of entities that attract your eye upwards and away from the historic material. And I think that in looking at, in looking at the visibility studies especially, um, I think that the addition of 105 would qualify in my view as minimally visible. Um, and I think part of that is because they set it back and because they did that little trick with raising the, the sidewall, which was effective. But also because I, I think that the um, shapeliness and cornice detailing of the 107 bay, bay shape um, does tend to draw one's eye upwards uh, in a way that I think uh, detracts from the historic streetscape that we're trying to preserve and that the applicant's other efforts are strengthening. So um, I would suggest that they take a look at ways to modify that so that it is a little bit less prominent. I think that the idea of a bay window kind of looming on the roof there, it, it kind of, it, it seems like it, it wants to be noticed a little bit more than we would want rooftop elements to be noticed. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, I sort of agree uh, with uh, most of the comments. I think the uh, the lowering of the uh, cornice is successful. I like the fact that they, the applicant has responded to previous commissioner's concern, especially with the elevator uh, bulkhead shifting back. Uh, I do agree with Adi that you know if there's something else that can be done. Uh, I do not know what it is at this moment, but I think overall the applicant has addressed the three major items that the commission raised the last time. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Jefferson? Um, an, an Herculean uh, effort by the architects. And I, I think the Cornish parapet, I think they resolved that. I think they resolved the elevator that was resolved. I think that there's too much visibility still. And I think it has to do with the octagon. And I think they should take a look at that. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Gustafson. Um. I had been particularly concerned about the vagueness of the information about that um, that wall at the, on the at the uh, top floor in the rear, uh, so I'm uh, pleased with the result on that. Um, I am uh, like uh, many of the commissioners, uh, still very concerned about the visibility of the um, over the over the front of the um, of the building. Um, I'm also a um, a bit disturbed that I might actually have been on the commission that approved 109. Um, uh, but anyway, so um, I think that's still got to be worked on. Okay. All right. I want to thank you all for uh, your careful and considered comments here. So I think uh, we're very close on this application at this point. Um, I think two of the three um, major areas that, that we had asked you to study have been responded to successfully. And it's really just thinking about the visibility of the rooftop additions and looking at one or both changes to one or both of them. And uh, particularly looking at that octagon bay window form, uh, which I think is calling attention to the addition. So um, we'll ask you to think about um, how you can further reduce uh, or simplify and or sort of reduce and simplify the rooftop the visibility of the rooftop addition. Um, and we'll leave that up to you to, to figure out if you want to do that by setting back further or changing shape or materials just to sort of make it less, more neutral and less um, catching, uh, attention catching. So um, we'll come back for this final piece when you have a revised proposal. We'll see you as ready as soon as we can when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, so that concludes our day today. We uh, had a very long day and I wanna thank everybody for 
sticking it out and being thoughtful and considered and uh, careful as you always are, but for a very long time today. So thank you and we'll see you next week. Goodbye everybody. Okay.